everybody, and welcome back to the Chiluminati Podcast, episode 201. That sounds so weird to say. Or I can say 200. I get the 200 and 200 part, two. part yeah, yeah, two. Yeah, yeah, Alex, shush. Excuse me? As always, I'm one of your hosts, Mike Martin, joined by the James Corden and Matthew Horn of LA. Ooh. I want to be Matthew Horn for sure in the James Corden. Yeah, I don't like how I got. I don't like this. I don't like that you you push that on me. I mean, I just spoke first. That's what you got to do. Nobody wants to be James Corden. You know what? Here's the truth. If between the two of us, if one of us was more of an asshole, I think the audience would agree. It's probably who's closer to being James Corden. I'll tell you this. I get a lot of free wine at restaurants and I don't know that James Corden does. And I'll leave it at that. I mean, there's a lot of whining. But uh, I don't know. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, that is correct. Welcome back to part two of the Greenstone part three, where, and I mean this sincerely, all will be made good. Things once hazy will become clear. You will all soon realize your time wasn't wasted by any measure. Jesse (laughs) will earnestly apologize for doubting me. And in the end, (laughs) 30% of our unsubscribed users in admiration of this feat will head straight over and sign up at patreon.com slash chillmoneypod for reasons so insane you will scarcely be able to believe it. And as this continues to be our very 200th episode, we are once again joined by Michael Raparez, who you may know as the most emotionally grounded and stoic host of the fantastic and now <laughs> 10-year running Video Game Apocalypse on the Laser Time Network, who has become the ongoing and unwitting marathon guest host stuck in this greenstone limbo with us <laughs> and someone who was finally just as excited as I was to be talking about the hyper evolved race of ancient humanoid earthlings that lived here before us and speaks to us from across time and space in the Assassin's Creed series. Michael. Hell yeah. Welcome back to the show. Thank you so much for having now me. Now for your very, your, it's, your, it's now your fourth episode. Crendor has been <laughs> annihilated as one of our most common guests. You have now been and on. He was, he's due a guest spot soon. He already told me what he wants to cover. So. Uh, emotionally grounded and stoic sounds, that is such a nice way of saying I'm boring. It's uh, not boring. <laughs> it's not boring. It's just some people use the podcast to go and just mm-hmm. release everything that's bothering them in the world. And other people. Rain it on in. Keep mm-hmm. it on track. Somebody's got to press the button that says number yeah. four. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, somebody's got to be like, well, here's all the stuff I researched about this game. Yeah, that's that's me today right now. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and anyway, speaking of that, if just like last week, if you're digging the Alex and Michael vibe and you want to keep it going, I'm also going to be guesting again on Vigigame Game Apocalypse. Find it at videogameapocalypse.com. Last time, we got super nerdy about all the ancient alien races from video yes. games, but this time, we're going to be talking about punching zombies to yeah. death. Game, games right? where you get to punch zombies to death. It, you, yeah. it seems like a really bad idea, but games make it really fun when you can do that's, it. Just... That's the type of kinetic, outrageous activity that video games are perfect for making into an everyday activity. Yeah, it was inspired by a video someone posted of using knuckle dusters in Dead Island 2 and putting their fist directly through a zombie's head. And like, I want to play that now. I want to play five other games that let me do that. I need you to know, I not only did I play... I punched a zombie so hard their eyes popped out and then dangled as I continued to punch them. And it was (laughs) one of the greatest things I've ever experienced. I was like, this is so gross. Oh, it was lovely. The gore in that game is insane. I love it. It's absolutely nuts. Yeah. Uh, We were talking about on Michael's pod about like why gamers love of those who came before storyline. Like why that, even though it's like in every single video game that's a triple a video game why do you think so many triple a games are still using the those who came before premise like what is the essential one what is like the game with that in it? what do you mean those who came before like people who lived on the planet prior to us like these people were here yeah. these people were here before us they're so mysterious assassin's creed basically yeah, yeah. every single rpg ever created in the history of video games he's talking earth why specifically that- i think yeah, why is that? Every I, single yeah. one. But even Mass Effect, every single yeah. one. Yeah. I don't think there's, there's always like because it's fun to unravel a mystery about the ancients. I think like even Horizon yeah. Zero Dawn does it really yep. well, where it's like the ancients are us in the modern day. To take Spoilers. what they establish yeah. as normal and then yeah. say, oh, but none of this is actually normal. You don't know what came before kind of thing. Yeah, it's a fun thing to do. It's kind of like the same reason people get into QAnon, but like safe. Unfortunately, true. Yeah. <laughs> Harmless. Uh, anyway, 
Enough about ancient paradimensional alien races contacting their progeny in the far future. Let's wrap up the Greenstone saga, thereby satisfying everyone on Earth, shall we? I don't know, Alex. Shall we? Uh, don't don't shall we me? I don't know. I don't know anymore if we're going to get like blue balled until the show ends. First off, let's start with a little recap and background so we can start tying some of these wildly frayed threads together, sort of like in the opposite way of Rise of Skywalker. Same vibe, the opposite effect. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? It's like Rise of Skywalker, which was not the greatest film. And we're going to be doing that right now, but it's going to be... Not the greatest is such a nice way of putting that. It's going to be the same as Rise of Skywalker, <laughs> the but the opposite. I might even say the worst Star Wars movie that mm. exists. That's what I promised for you today. <laughs> I, I might say you, one of the worst movies, period, but like, whatever. I promise mm. you the Rise of Skywalker of Chiluminati episodes, but the opposite. Somehow the Green Stone returned. I don't like that you start with the rise of Skywalker of Chiluminati episodes. But opposite. But opposite. That can be taken out of context. Yeah. Anyway, as we discovered last week, UFO investigator Andrew Collins and paranormal researcher and historian Graham Phillips received word from at least five separate sources, psychic, spiritual, metaphysical, astral projecting sources about a coming event that their small group was going to have to be ready for that was, quote, beyond their understanding which of course ended up being the emergence of the green stone, uh, which we've covered extensively already on the show. But what's really interesting to keep in mind right now is that at least two of these sources can be directly connected to UFO encounters. Uh, Firstly, the Avely abduction in 1974, which you can re-listen to last week's excellent, excellent and informative, worthwhile listening uh, episode for lots of information uh, about the Avely abduction, uh, if you'd uh, like, before starting this one as it will make this episode more fun, if you ever heard the one that I did last week before it. Uh, and then, as we only briefly got into near at the, uh, the end of last episode, the Sunderland family encounter was the other uh, UFO-related Greenstone prophecy, uh, which directly involved Marion and her daughter Gaynor Sunderland, who have been main characters in the Greenstone from the beginning, just in case you didn't remember them from a few years ago. So let's take a closer look at their case now, because it makes a perfect segue into the real meat of today's episode, which is coming in just after this. Uh, So I only touched on this briefly last week, but Gaynor was a nine-year-old girl in 1976 when she saw her aliens, who had a reputation among locals for being a little spacey and mystical-seeming, reporting colored lights in the sky on three occasions, even before her encounter on July of 1976, which is the one that eventually drew Graham and his fellow investigator, Martin Keatman, to the little Welsh village of Oakenholt after they saw this primary source article about it in the September 1979 issue of Flying Saucer Review by Jenny Randalls and Paul Wetnell. Uh, so basically, 1978, after Close Encounters, the movie was released, which Mathis has now seen. I have. I've seen it. And therefore can step yes. into the zeitgeist with us. Uh, uh, Gaynor's, uh, Gaynor's uh, younger brother, that. Darren, was like, he, like saw some on the news about the movie or saw a trailer for the movie on TV or something like that. And her brother, Darren asked what a close encounter was because he thought that he might've had one. And this was, was, uh, you know, Gaynor freaked out about this, which is like really not characteristic of her. She's usually like a pretty calm collected girl, but she started to like brutally make fun of him and say things like, aha, little green men, Mathis, I'm sure, you know, this feeling quite well. Uh, before she like stormed out of the room without even it's hearing the, the story. whole audience, man. She was like, oh yeah, wow, alien story, big whoop. Uh, but when her little brother left and she was alone with her mom, she came to her mom and she was like, I only made fun of him because I also saw something. I also had a close encounter and I don't know what to do about it. So mm-hmm. both, both of them have similar stories of multiple strange looking creatures, some humanoid, some smaller with scary animal features, just like in the Avely abduction, all of them wearing space suits, making strange whip, whimpering sounds as they like collected or deposited soil samples or perhaps destroyed some sort of strange bioluminescent alien life that had been uh accidentally growing in the field by mistake or something they were just trying to put together what they were saying it didn't really make sense with like what humans do uh but that's kind of the vibe that they were getting and both of the kids ran away before they made direct contact both kids like caught the attention of the aliens but they also like booked it before uh so then Gaynor came back. She said she came back the next day just to see what was up at the site of her alien encounter. And she saw that where they were like scooping or whatever they were doing in the dirt, there was now like 
freshly grown grass coming out of those areas. Uh, so she thought that was kind of interesting uh, where they were messing with the soil. And also, even as a young kid, uh, almost a year apart, two different interviews with Gaynor, she said the exact same thing both times. And they actually, the second time that they interviewed her a year later, they literally threw in things that were like, and that's when they like sprouted their heads and started like, you know, like they they threw in things that they thought that if she was faking it, that she would just go along with also. As if she maybe like forgot that she said that last time. She corrected them every time that they gave her a lie to say. So that's hmm. pretty interesting. Uh, also, it's worth noting hmm. that in the, just like in the Avely encounter, in the years after the encounter with the alien, Gaynor also uh, started to do really well in school, much more. She had like a reversal with her, with her schooling. She was getting really bad grades, wasn't doing anything. Then suddenly school was like beyond, like she was like beyond school. She was like totally smart enough. Uh, but her brother Darren, whose story had slowly become more and more shaky compared to Gaynor's, had become impossible to get talking. So he kind of like shut down and maybe didn't have the same type of experience as Gainer or maybe the effect. Uh, well, I mean, the that's common effect. though. Yeah. No, because exactly. UFO abductions always have this personal thread that runs through them. A lot of them have a lot of similarities, but there's like a weird personal twist on it. Some people get banged by aliens. Some people get strapped to a machine and forcibly seated. Yeah. Other people go up and... They, remember the, the story we talked about where they walked on the ship and they saw people cutting meat why, with a meat cleaver? Why did we immediately jump to like <laughs> yeah. sex aliens? That's top of the of list. All the things at the top. Yeah, banging and seeing. Um, it is my, my if, I, if I got one wish from a genie. <laughs> what is the wish? To fuck an alien? Yep. It like covers two bases at once. Is that why? I think so. Okay. All right. Well, all right. Well, you know what? I, you know what? I can't argue with a man who knows himself. Uh, so, so that first... UFO encounter happened. It was weirding everybody out. Then the Sutherland, the Sunderlands began having more UFO encounters. Uh, first, Gaynor alone starts having some more. Then Marion and her extremely skeptical, uh, skeptical husband, Frederick, started seeing colored lights in the sky. And then Gaynor and her older brother, Carl, had a weird like late night encounter uh, on their way back from the disco one night, uh, which I guess younger kids than Americans go to, because uh, that was only a couple years later. Uh, that she was at the disco and she was nine in 76. Uh, so she had a, she had a weird late night encounter with a, with a craft with her brother that had left behind some kind of luminescent green residue also, which was interesting to me because it kind of reminded me of the mist from the Avely encounter. Uh, and then her family and other villagers began witnessing Gaynor being visited by these lights in her sleep, even when Gaynor wasn't aware of it. Like, so they'd be like, I saw a light coming to your house, hmm. you know, like stuff like that. Uh, there was also an anonymous 16 year old girl in town who reported a strange object on the ground that she saw in 1978 and two further sightings, uh, around the area, one in 1975 and one from 1979, both craft really similar looking, both with beings in shiny silver suits. Mm -hmm. And this is all in a five mile radius from the Sunderland house in Wales. And just for those uh, who may be new, uh, you know, or, or for you, Mike, uh, yeah, you know, a lot of people have, and especially in third, uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, which really popularized the naked alien. Uh, for the most part, a majority of the sightings, they were wearing weird little suits, sometimes silver, sometimes orange, always like covered the entire body. That part is also not necessarily weird compared to other abduction cases. Right. Yeah. Um, so they haven't evolved beyond the need for clothing. Yeah. Well, or maybe, yeah, they or just or like, maybe, maybe they're Earth just like inhabit uh, uninhabitable. That's a great question. Them. Yes. Maybe they just look like pajamas like or maybe, maybe they just, just if they're using our conscious or they need us it's taking here's the thing it, we think is what they should wear there's always an answer there's always it, 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 no matter what question you ask if you're like well, why do they need clothes someone will be like oh well the ones that don't have clothes those are probably just robots or well, like artificial Hitmon creations Chan. you know like that kind of there's no is, is born yeah. with a championship belt you know he's got a little boxing outfit on when he's born so like you never know but, uh, you never know maybe, what's real what's maybe they fake. just like the feel of silver lemonade that's what it's a matter and Jesse, great was like, everything Tony the aliens Soprano? do make no goddamn sense that's the point like nothing they do remember they got confused by betty's zipper when they were trying yeah. to like mess with they're like what is this zipper this everybody but weird. mathis remember the arrival everybody but mathis i've never seen it so. yeah uh yeah you guys know what i'm saying heartbreaking uh, i do not so yeah it's not that amazing that they all had silver suits, but it is interesting that these cases that were all close to each other were quite consistent between each other. Uh, then uh, Marion Gaynor, Marion and Gaynor begin 
having psychic impressions and dreams of these like smiling entities of the kind that she saw in the craft and dreams of being back on board the UFOs without being sure if they were visions or something that was actually happening to them or like maybe they got the sense that it was some sort of like real time feed with the spacecraft through their brain or something uh, until it all culminated on March 24th, 1979. That night, she was babysitting at a friend's house as Gaynor uh, when she suddenly called her mom over at like 9 p.m., 9.30. She was like, come over, and her mom got there by 10.30. And here is an excerpt from Michael to read about what happened that night, which I got from a magazine. I actually had to do research to find this. Listen, everybody, I think I'm addicted to putting nuts in my mouth. Big nuts, small nuts, crunchier nuts, hard nuts. The more nuts in my mouth, the better. I just love the texture of nuts. Thank you to nuts.com for sponsoring today's episode. Peanuts, almonds, cashews, hell, even gummy bears, olives? Does that sound good? What about popcorn? Do you like saltwater tablet? If all these things sound delicious to you, you're gonna wanna do yourself a favor and head over to nuts.com. They've got you covered with all the snacks that you could possibly want. And it's way healthier than what I was doing prior to this. You know that like 11 a.m. feeling after breakfast, but not quite lunch, you're a little hungry. You want to snack on something instead of grabbing something like, I don't know, a full on meal. Might as well just grab some nuts or olives or gum, you know, a snack from them. Nuts.com is your one stop shop for freshly roasted nuts, dried fruits, sweets, pantry staples like specialty flowers and more. They have a wide selection, meaning they have something for everyone. And if you have a gluten-free diet or you like organic stuff, they have all that stuff covered too. I've been munching on nuts. Like I said at the beginning, I've been munching on some, I've been munching on some nuts for a while and just putting a lot of nuts in my mouth and I've, I've really enjoyed it. Honestly, it brings me back to being a kid. My dad's favorite snack was having peanuts in the house. So having peanuts in the house along with cashews and almonds are kind of nice. If, out of those three, if I had to pick a favorite, don't tell my dad, but I think I might go with the cashews. There's just something about a cashew in my mouth, slightly roasted, very lightly salted. Mm, it kind of hits that snack spot without making me like super mega thirsty or something. You might as well just give it a shot. It's not expensive and having some healthier snack options in the house is always a good idea. So right now, nuts.com is offering new customers a free gift with purchase and free shipping on all orders of $29 or more at nuts.com slash chill. So all you gotta do is go check out all the delicious options at nuts.com slash chill, and you're gonna receive yourself a free gift and free shipping when you spend over $29. Simple as that. So go check it out one more time at nuts.com slash chill. Thank you to nuts.com for not only sponsoring this episode, but filling my cheeks with nuts. From time to time, Gaynor glanced anxiously around the room, and she seemed uneasy. Suddenly, while they were talking about something else, she leapt up and sat by her mother. She regained her composure and mentioned that she had never felt happy in their house. She sensed a presence there. Then she added, I think they are important people, leaders or scientists, something like that. They are important in their world. They are beautiful to their own kind. They think they are pretty. I don't think all their kind look like that. What they were doing was important to them. Do you understand? Mrs. Sunderland was shocked, but nodded in the affirmative. Excuse me. Gaynor instantly returned to her old self and never mentioned anything more about it or them again. She seemed as if a weight was lifted from her mind. And then we skip a little bit of weird speculation until one must accept that there was some involvement of psychology. Mrs. Sunderland unconsciously transferred a feeling that Gaynor says she had anyway that was that more was to come, and Gaynor was under a lot of pressure during this period. Yeah, so weird alien message, more was to come, and uh, that's on top of the uh, message that she gave about these people coming together for this task, right? Yeah. Uh, it was at this point that Gaynor started putting out messages in the paper for other people with similar UFO encounters to come forward. And just mm -hmm. before the saga of the Greenstone proper happened, she met a boy her own age who was called Andrew James, who said that he had been out walking back in 1976, the same week in July that Gaynor and her brother had their big experience on the same street that Gaynor was on when she was riding her bike that day. And as he walked along the outer rim of one of the housing estates in Oakenholt in that village, one summer afternoon, 
like I said, a week uh, within a week of that Gainer incident, he could see out over the Oakenholt School from where he was up on the ridge, and he spotted a bright, multicolored object hovering in the air above it. Suddenly, it banked towards him and got close enough to where he could see figures looking at him from inside before shooting off into the distance and disappearing. He, too, reported psychic contact in the weeks and months following his encounter and emerging psychic abilities, but it wasn't until after the Greenstone proper kicked off that Gaynor was able to follow up. So, really quickly, let's do a Cliff Notes recap of the last two episodes uh, from 2021. Now that we have all this added context, just so we can put all this stuff together, and also, just in case, uh, Jesse, Mathis, and Michael didn't want to go back and listen to, like, fucking three and a half hours of everything that they need to know to be on on board with this, just in case you guys didn't do that in preparation for this episode, just in case. You got me. You caught me. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a bad host. I didn't go back and just listen. I'm sorry. Basically, just as these aliens had shared with Marion Sunderland, there was more to come, and in the second half of 1979, the Parasearch Group, through psychic contact between Graham Phillips and a mysterious entity that they called Joanna, they were made aware of powerful ancient Egyptian stones. Uh, or one, one powerful ancient Egyptian stone produced by the husband of Nefertiti, Pharaoh Amenhotep IV. After supposedly receiving secret knowledge from the megalithic peoples of ancient Britain, whose proud civilization and people, like the elves of Middle Earth, <laughs> were slowly withering away. Time! I, whoa! Whoa! I already... Whoa! This is all from the previous episodes. Wait, well, hold, I just... just, I don't think this all sunk into my brain. What you're telling me is that Nefertiti's husband... Amenhotep IV. Like ancient, ancient... Not like, a, you know, ancient Egypt. I'm talking ancient, ancient Egypt. Pretty, pretty ancient this Egypt. This dude... Yeah made a gem via After. knowledge yeah. that he, he received yes. from yes. people in Great Britain who left because who were like, like on the white ships. Yeah. Right. They left on the right. white ships, but they, they, instead of, <laughs> okay. instead of right. wherever they went, Galador or whatever the fucking, fucking hell they went, they went to ancient Egypt. Sussex. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then, and then they went to America after that, and that's where they set up their colony. No, they went to Egypt first, and then we'll get to that. So to them, this information that they're passing, like, like right now, literally right now, to them, this information mm. was like a secret-filled baton that they were like passing on to the next great civilization of the world. So that's why they went to Egypt. Sure. And whatever this info was must have been pretty potent, because upon hearing it, Amenhotep IV changed his name to the much more known today, and you know what I'm going to say, Akhenaten. And in one mm, of the of ballsiest moves in history, he straight up replaced the central religion of the empire, moved the capital to a city he made up, and changed the art style of his entire empire with a whole new monotheistic religion under Aten, an aspect of Ra, who is now redefined as an all-important deity named after an orb or a disc shape likely connected with the sun. Everybody was calling him the disc for a long time, Aten the disc, but... In recent times, it's more likely that even though the drawings were in 2D, the thinking was in 3D. Akhenaten <laughs> supposedly Double. created the green stone, like I said, which he imbued with this knowledge and then placed on the top of the Great Pyramid, like I said before, where it charged each day by the sun. Uh, however, predictably, predictably, the people of Egypt mostly hated this new religion. And 17 years later, when Akhenaten died, things immediately upon his death started swinging back to the way they were. And Akhenaten's followers, the few that there were, were now in danger of being persecuted and apparently chose to flee back to the origin of their secret knowledge. And in the late 14th century BC, resettled back in Britain at a place you might remember from the previous episodes that was called Barry Ring in central England, which we, 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 we uh, talked about back in uh, the, the pandemic. Centuries later, it was a warrior queen who was directly descended from these uh, ancient no. Egyptian people, mm -hmm. uh, a woman called Gwevera. Okay, never mind. Who Ooh. eventually married and became King Arthur's wife, Guinevere. There it is. What? There it is. <laughs> there we go. So centuries later, Guinevere, who was a descendant of Akhenaten and his teachings, which were me megalithic teachings originally, but are now back. It's, you know, 
a lot of people who make up history just kind of like want to make their country seem like the best. Sure. But mm -hmm. I, you know, I just said that for no reason. It has nothing to do with what I'm saying. <laughs> she became Guinevere, who upon her death. You mean Kira Knightley? Yes. In the face of changing time, she placed the green stone into the care of a secret society called, quote, the Nine, who kept the stone all the way through Roman occup occupation of Britain, all the way to the Dark Ages, uh, until it passed into the hands of who else but the Knights Templar from Assassin's Creed. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, a secretive organization in opposition to the Nine, which we, uh, which we talked about briefly. Oh, I lost my scroll. Hold on. I lost my scroll, guys. Oh, no. Unfortunately, Better hire a search to find it. Yeah, no, we're back. We're back. Apple F. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, a secretive organization in opposition to the Nine was also formed in ancient history to use the stone to usher in a new age of evil. And in 1307, we talked oh. about this uh, last time, it was these people who sold out the Templar leadership in Paris and sealed the fate of the Templars and got them destroyed that first time. Uh, eventually, however, through back channels and secret agents, the stone eventually made its way to Mary, Queen of Scots, in the 16th century during a burst of new knowledge and culture inspired by some kind of incredible explosion in space, which eventually became a movement known as Rosicrucianism. So that's where we get the Rosicrucians, and I talked briefly about how the, Re the Rosicrucians probably weren't a real thing. They were kind of more like a like the mods or the punks or the goths rather than like, hmm. like a secret society that as people say, there's a different secret society now that's called Rosicrucians, but they are not as old as all that. I'm talking about like a movement of intellectuals basically. Uh, but yeah, upon her execution in 1587, Mary queen of Scots gave the stone, which was now called the Meonia or the Meonia stone to a young Rosicrucian called Robert Catesby for safe, safekeeping, but in 1604, during Catesby's failed gunpowder plot to destroy the Protestant parliament and install a Catholic queen on the throne, during which he was supposed to use the, uh, the green stone to guarantee success, his partner Guy Fox was caught underneath the building setting up all the bombs, and the whole crew was chased out into the Midlands and mostly killed. During this wild pursuit, the stone was hidden away at a place called Harvington Hall in Kidderminster in the care of a man called Humphrey Packington, if you guys remember Packington. Packington was the guy who commissioned some murals, which he hid behind a mm. wall at Harvington Hall, yeah. where eventually our pals I Graham Phillips yes. and Andrew Collins, uh, who we re-met again last episode, found them, put together the clues surrounding the nine worthies, and eventually, hmm. who were all, by the way, luminaries and thinkers and gr nine great leaders from human history, by the way. I don't know if you've heard that before today already. <laughs> and eventually followed them to a bridge at a place known as Knight's Pool in Severn Stoke, where they were able to locate a small sword with the phrase, Meonia for Mary, etched on the blade. Okay? We remember that. When they brought Gaynor, yeah. When we brought, when they brought Gaynor to Knight's Pool on the advice of a psychic presence that she was in contact with, she used the sword to point them towards a tower, uh, notably one that was clearly from the 19th century and not old enough to be from Mary, Queen of Scots time, which was weird. Wait a minute. But we're going to get into that a little bit more later as well. You told me this wasn't going to be Rise of Skywalker and she has a magic sword that points to a fucking place you need to go. Just listen. It's the opposite. You're failing at so far. It's the opposite. And the timing doesn't make, the timing doesn't make any sense. Like, why would there be a dagger that looks just, like the ruins just, of the Death Star? Just remember were, the... Mm, Details, details. Somehow the emperor returned. It's <laughs> almost exactly the same. It's almost exactly the same fallacy that makes Ray use that sword. That makes Gainer use this sword. Somehow the green stone returned. <laughs> but 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 it's opposite because I'm going to explain it to you. Just remember that I said this. The tower was not correct. Just remember that. Uh, it's not anachronistically. It was anachronistic. In this tower, though, that's where they encountered the spirit of a giant swan, uh, which knocked down a, quote, large chunk of masonry, and which eventually led them to a bend in the River Avon nearby, known as Swan's Neck Bend, uh, all while being pursued by this local coven, if you remember, which was now racing them to the stone's resting place for their own sinister ends. All they were trying to, all this coven of witches was trying to do was under the under the control of an evil power, they wanted to stop this group from getting the green stone so that they could use it for themselves. Well, I, you know, 
I know I haven't seen a lot of movies, but I feel like I've seen this one. Like a lot. Listen, I just told <laughs> it you. Sounds it's the same like... people that took down the Templars in 1307. And they're now in a in a witch's coven nearby the berry ring as well. Trying to stop evil an evil group from bringing in an age of darkness. The good the good fellowship and the bad fellowship are both trying to get the, the thing at the same time, but only the guy from the good fellowship wrote a book. Okay. Right. <laughs> right, right. That's important. That's a bit of a spoiler. <laughs> so according but to how Gain- can we believe him? Well, well, we already know what happened to that group. So according mm-hmm. to Gaynor, this group was planning to carry out their ritual of evil at midnight on the 31st of October. She got all this from uh, a psychic to, to like commit like communication correct this whole time there's been this guevara joanna lady in white that sometimes speaks through them and that they've been able to contact and okay. speak to okay. some sort of psychic presence that's guiding them though they've been cagey about who they are exactly we'll get into that some more in a little bit as well um but yeah they were planning to carry out this ritual on the 31st of october they needed the stone to perform a reflection ritual to render the coven powerless so that they could delay evil's progress that much longer and get the stone into their power so that's what they needed to do uh, that was the first quest of the Green Stone, which we're going to get into again just to tell you what happened. But here we go. The guiding presence that was helping them led Graham to the area separate from the group, enabled him to grab a casket containing the stone from right under the noses of the strange coven without anybody noticing. And inside the casket, when he looked to see if it, the Green Stone was inside, he also found a black guardian stone, which he psychically felt would try and destroy the green stone in order to protect it so he got a trowel and he flicked the 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 the, the guardian stone into the river and took everything else back with him with Man, that's group. some shit ass protection magic if you can just be like mm, yeah. and it's like <laughs> in the river you're like sweet wait till you see how strong oh. the protection magic All is right. that's that's a story mm. for another time oh my god uh, no it needs to be a story no, no. for this time <laughs> no that's not part of the green stone story don't worry uh the next day uh The next day, Halloween night, the night of the coven's ritual, they were followed back to the Swan's Neck by strange men in a white Ford Escort. But they tricked those guys. They like got out of their cars and like walked around and were like looking around and were like, oh, I guess we can't find the stone. And then they like got in their cars and left. And that was like how they tricked those guys into letting them think that they didn't have the stone already, which Graham went and got on his own in the middle of the night. So back at Marion's house, two hours uh, before the ceremony, uh, they're in Oakenholt. Uh, they're all just about able to make it in time, all to join hands, and they have the stone. And Marion watches in a vision as their intention of a magical reflection thwarts the dark witch woman that they saw chanting in front of the fire in her black robe, surrounded by her dismayed acolytes. And they just in time put up the blocking spell that the green stone can put up to stop them from getting access to the green stone's power and defeating that coven forever. So that form of evil gone and that's where we left we know what they were specifically attempting to do with the coven so it's about just tipping the balance like the world tendency gotcha in uh demon souls it was like Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's like you want the powers of the green stone in possession of good or hidden you don't want evil forces to be able to have access to it to like enact magic upon and we're sure the good guys won what year was this we're sure they won right well listen that night they slept thinking they defeated evil (laughs) <laughs> oh, oh shit. there's a sequel gotcha, gotcha it's gotcha. not a sequel it's part th- three of the green stone <laughs> last night that night not last night it was like over 40 years ago they slept thinking they defeated evil but in reality they'd only just woken it up and their true quest was just about to begin <laughs> and now we're back at Gaynor's house in 1979 where after weeks of nothing happening she suddenly oh, begins shoot. automatically she does like automatic drawing, like channeling drawing from somewhere else. Sure. Uh, she's, she's drawn the Meonia stone on an altar in the center of a stone circle surrounded by burial mounds and tombs. And people are seeing her do this and they're already like, what the fuck are you doing? And it's piquing everybody's interest. But things went into overdrive when she gets a call from Andrew James, the boy who saw aliens on her street a couple years before. And they talked on the, on the, uh, they had just been talking before she got involved in all the green stone stuff. And he called her back. And sure enough, uh, even though the green stone had just been found and no one had told anyone outside the Parasearch group what they were looking into, Andrew said that he was calling because he was also having visions of a green stone and Akhenaten and burial tombs. And he claimed to have the strong notion that wherever this green rock was, 
Akhenaten's lost people in Britain used it directly against the evil force that brought down the original British megalithic peoples that fled Egypt in the first place. Um, so it all comes together. Then shortly thereafter, John <laughs> Ward, who I mentioned last time, the ex-military astral projection guy who had one of the visions that brought them all together in the first place, he also calls them out of the blue because he's seen them in his sleep on Halloween night defeating the witches that Marion saw in her vision uh, during the ritual. No one was sure what to expect, but the vibes were bad and felt sinister, like things were about to get pretty bad again. And truly, it's this month of November where things rapidly go from weird and off-putting to full-on scary as shit. Because firstly, Alan Beard, one of the Parasearch members prone to psychic impressions, had begun receiving extreme feelings of anxiety and fear, and the notion that someone was trying to isolate him from his friends. And it all came to a head one day on his way into his job, though he collected himself in the parking lot. He was like having like all these really bad, like kind of anxiety attack type feelings. He got to work and like pulled himself together in his car. He couldn't get it off his mind, but he had a largely normal day until this happened, which I'll have Mathis read for us now. I'm going to drop this one in Twitter. for you. Later that morning, one of the girls in the office looked at him strangely. These people, she said, the people you're involved with, how well do you know them? Alan looked at her. What was she thinking about? What was she talking about? Marion, Terry, and the others, perhaps? This is not possible. The girl knew nothing of his private life. What do you mean, he asked. You know damn well, she replied, staring him hard in the eyes, and suddenly her expression became more intense. They're evil. You must have done, uh, you must have nothing more to do with them. He was surprised and frightened. She was staring straight at him, her eyes blank and expressionless. What did she mean? How could she know? He suddenly remembered the warning and the feeling he had experienced earlier that morning. He knew she was being used. No, I don't believe that, he said defiantly. Still, her eyes pierced him. Who are you? He stammered. Her expression changed to a star sardonic grin. She laughed. <laughs> you don't think you will die yet. Do Wait, what? You don't think you will die yet, do you? Well, you will. You will die in a road accident. Oh, uh, that's unfortunate. <laughs> you will die yet. N yeah, what the fuck? <laughs> yes, you will die, you dumb living thinker. He mm -hmm. was terrified but said nothing. Suddenly it was gone. The girl stared around her, a puzzled expression on her face as if she did not know where she was. She looked at Alan and smiled nervously before returning to her work. He immediately telephoned Marion and told her what had happened. The opposition was far from beaten. Yep. So shit's getting weird again. Then the empire strikes uh, back again. Mm -hmm. That's right. Later that month, Barry King is in town from London. The guy who helped Andrew Collins with the Avely UFO case from last episode. And on Monday, November 5th, 1979, he's planning to stay the night at Graham's place in Wolverhampton with Andy in an old Victorian building, <laughs> still looking pretty solid for its age as it was currently in use as Paris search HQ. We're all back to the beginning of, of episode one, baby. That's right. It's, it's happening. Let it sink in. This is real. I'm, I'm sinking. It's yeah. sinking deep. Just after midnight, Barry suddenly got so cold that he actually got up and complained. But once he was up, he felt the unmistakable sense that something was there in the room with him, even pointing repeatedly at one bookcase where he was sure the thing was standing until out of nowhere, it sounded like someone smacked the side of it hard with a hammer and made this huge metallic crash. And then after a couple seconds while everybody's looking at it and freaked out that that happened, it happened again while everyone was looking at it. Not saying they're definitely connected, uh, but that does sound an awful lot like some of the paranormal activity that the Avis family reported seeing in their home uh, with the Morse code scratching and feeling something running around in the room with them. I'm yep, um, yep, just saying, just throwing that, that out there. Uh, but yeah, Barry King was so spooked by the whole thing that he literally packed up and went home, did not stay the night at Parasearch HQ. Uh, then one week later, on the road back from Marion and Gaynor's place in Oakenholt, group members Terry Shotton and Alan Beard again, same guy who saw this woman get possessed at work, uh, while they were confiding in each other uh, during the, the drive home about how bad they felt the vibes were getting, Alan caught sight of a huge light in his rearview mirror for a second. And as you might have guessed, a few miles later, they noticed a big red-orange light that caught up alongside of them a little further off from where they were at in the sky that followed them flying alongside them in total silence for miles, slowly getting closer to the car until just as they're about to turn up the road at a nearby farmhouse to call it in uh, like responsible UFO hunters, it just mm -hmm. bounces off and speeds off into the night. And 
even as they drove home, they were afraid the whole time that they were going to see it again, even though they did not see it again. Um, Interesting. Yeah. No green gas this time. No green gas, but they didn't get that involved. They 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 they, they hmm. just kind of like ran. They just kind of like were like, don't pay attention, don't engage. They just kind of were scared of it, and they were feeling paranoid because I don't think they believed that they were going to get. I don't think they believed they were going to get like UFO'd out. You know what I mean? I thought. I mm-hmm. think maybe they thought that like the threat was coming from like, you know, magic or whatever the hell the evil coven yeah i don't know so whatever it was they they that just happened and they they were spooked by it and then a couple weeks later in early december same group heads back to marion's house again in wales terry and alan uh just to follow up on the whole ufo thing see if there was anything to see since now they've seen a ufo there also suddenly for the first time alan gets the same type of psychic communication that gainer often gets at the exact same time that gainer gets it uh, from a presence that Gaynor and Marion have been feeling around the house all day. Uh, and Jesse, uh, here's an excerpt from that message. Uh, <clears throat> Alan seemed to be the most in tune, for he suddenly had a further impression of the words, the key to time and life, entering his mind when the others asked him about the stone. Suddenly, a vivid image flashed through Gaynor's mind. Quickly, she drew what she had seen, a grassy hill with a single oak tree near the top. She was sure this, oh, that this was where their answers lay. At that time, they thought that the presence they had felt and who had given Alan the message, I am she that is with you, was in fact Joanna. They were sure they had to find her. Yeah. So, of course, the first thing they do is they go back to Graham Phillips, who was their contact point for Joanna when she like started speaking through him the first time. But this is actually the point in the timeline where uh, I actually mentioned this earlier uh, in earlier episodes, but Graham finally got this presence to say that, quote, Joanna was supposed to be this Joanna that he knew in college, who was like his acquaintance, who he'd only barely known. And she was now just like living in Cornwall somewhere. So immediately when the presence like told them this, they like went to Cornwall where she lived and visited her. And she just had like no fucking idea who they were. Mm-hmm. she was just like what the fuck is this so then after thinking about it for a while uh graham and them all decided they were going to believe that whoever this entity was that was contacting them uh was obscuring their identity for some unknown purpose and that maybe joanna was something they'd chosen to make themselves palatable or acceptable for humans to communicate with who knows now i don't know about you i'm not saying he did or did not do this this is just my pure speculation but if i was graham phillips I'd probably definitely have been thinking about the aliens from the Avely abduction at that time uh, that had warned the Avis family about the green stone and also said that the aliens were here to quote, observe and to lead through observation. Don't know. That's what they said. Could be something that you could be thinking about right now. If you are on the same zag that I'm on, I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) Jesse, did you say a key to time and life earlier? That's what that's what it said. What a mystery of the unknown. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, anyway, this revelation took the wind out of everyone's sails a little bit. And honestly, rightfully so, because things start to get a little tough on the team here for a little while. For some reason, being at their headquarters was filling everybody with this sort of overwhelming feeling of depression. And uh, since it was uh, kind of a volunteer operation, not like a big money operation, kind of ran on enthusiasm, the fact that people were getting ill whenever they'd come to the headquarters was really cutting down on the number of people who felt like coming in, keeping the train running every day. And it was really like impacting their ability to like be these people. It's like, you know, if suddenly the people that when you were a YouTuber back in the beginning and you just like were in your house, if they, the people that were helping you suddenly just like stopped helping you, you don't really feel as motivated to like continue doing your own thing at that point. Yeah. Uh, now, obviously, you could chalk this up to the green stone turning out to be nothing but trouble and morale just being kind of low because of all the shitty stuff that's happening. But then slowly but surely, things start to get a little bit more insidious starting with light bulbs beginning to explode on a day-to-day basis every couple of hours while people were there trying to work. Uh, just like, like they're replacing light bulbs all the time. 
By the end of January, mm. though, the, quote, electrical anomalies were actually getting to the point where they were becoming dangerous. And Graham and Andy were regularly getting, like, big-time electric shocked by, like, the fridge, kitchen appliances, the cooker, all kinds of stuff, which would continue to happen even in the face of checks by technicians and engineers who they'd have out. Uh, and they weren't finding anything wrong with any of the stuff or any of the wiring in the walls or anything. Um, and uh, one night... Wednesday, January 30th, 1980, at 5.30 p.m., Andy and Graham were there. The doorbell rang. Nobody was there. Uh, honestly, probably some kids messing with them, but they were in a fragile state. They were freaked out. Even though it made them uneasy, they were like, maybe we're just freaking out. Maybe these kids are fucking with us. Like, Maybe we just need to like chill out. Let's go make some coffee. So they're like chilling in the kitchen, drinking a cup of coffee, having a chat about stuff. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this smoke comes pouring in through the door that's like so thick that they can't see through it. And they thought the house was on fire. Uh, and so they like run out in a panic and they're like looking around, but the house doesn't seem to be on fire. And they realize the smoke has this weird sort of like incense smell that goes along with it, like this perfumey sort of sickly sweet smell that goes along with it, uh, which is another thing that I talked about the other day, if you remember. Um, just saying uh and uh <laughs> just another clear link between last 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 week's episode and this one and they realized that the smoke uh had no source it was just smoke it wasn't like emitting from somewhere it was like this like smoke that would like sort of materialize all at once and uh they opened all the windows and everything in the house and they had fans running still took 30 minutes for the smoke to go away and they're all freaked out, and they're waiting for it to clear. They call their friend Terry over to see what's up with the smoke, too. Terry sees the smoke. He gets there before it clears. He's like, what the fuck is this smoke? And they, you know, the smoke dissipates, and they're like, where did that smoke come from? They don't know. They calm down. They hang out. By 9 p.m., they're like, okay, all right. That was crazy. Terry's like, right, I'm going to leave. I'll see you guys later. He opens the door, and oh, God, stuck into the door a couple inches into the door is a leather bound handmade metal occult looking dagger with a 10 inch long blade uh, just stuck in the door. Okay. And they don't know what to make of this. It looks literally handmade. And uh, Terry calls Marion who says she's been expecting them to call her. And her first tip was not to touch or move the dagger in any way, but it was already too late. Uh, they'd already moved it because it was too cool looking. So she made them take it out into the shrublands across the street <laughs> and bury it in a hole full of salt using a trowel. A lot of trowels in this story. Oh, is it the same trowel you used to flick yeah. away the guardian It's like the Jar Jar Binks Sith Lord in this story. <laughs> yeah. Uh, turned out, according to some occult experts uh, that they called in London, uh, just to ask about like the design of it and stuff, the dagger was most likely something called a burin or a burin. Uh, which is used to carve effigies of potential targets for curses or hexes, which is kind of confirmed for them as much as they needed to be that they had actually become the victims of some sort of targeted psychic attack by some group and that the dagger had been left behind as a threat from the, this group just to start the mind games going. Hmm. So then Andy Collins calls the Avis family who've been abducted, uh, the Avely UFO family, asks, ask them if they can like use their psychic powers to try and soften this attack that's been happening against them and ruining their morale and stopping people from coming around their headquarters uh, and he called martin keatman who was a student at the time and whoever else he could think of who might also have the strength to protect him anybody psychically inclined he was like please come and help like earthbound literally uh but it was no use and by 10 30 p.m uh that night uh the thick black smoke was back the door to the room they were in slammed shut and it felt like something slammed against the door and they tried to get out of the room and they like couldn't do it. They were like surprised they couldn't do it. it took a couple guys to push open the, the door and it turned out that there was like a huge stack of unsold magazines that had been piled up against the door because like I said, they, they published their own magazine. They're a, they're a paranormal magazine uh, like operation. So a bunch of magazines like were like against the door and they had to like actually push it together to get out. And uh, the smoke had cleared by the time they opened the door but a few more light bulbs blew out before the night was over. Um, and the next day, the neighborhood cat Pig came in through the what office porch. Uh, Love yeah, that like name. he always did. Uh, at that mm. time of day, he was like one of those neighborhood cats that like knows when it's time to come visit for snacks and like pets and stuff. Uh, but he was suddenly scared away hissing by something that nobody could see right in the middle of the room, in the front room. Uh, and then like right after that, the other neighborhood cat, Mr. Green, a great came name. minutes after Pig. 
Yeah, that's their. That's know, their. I'm that was like their, these names. That was like their routine. Mm. Pig would come in, and then Mister Greedy would come in, so they didn't like have conflict, right? Uh, and then the same thing happened with Mister Greedy. He like got like one step in the door, saw something, quote unquote, in the middle of the room, freaked out, ran away. Uh, Five thirty p.m. next day, where uh, same day with the cats, the smoke comes back. Now this time it's only in the office room. Somebody literally sees it materialize all at once. No source, though at this point they're like angrily looking for a source because they're so annoyed by this like smelly, like corpse flower perfume, black smoke. Uh, And they're getting really nervous because the next day is Friday, February 1st. And if they are under psychic attack, it's likely that that might go down on Friday, February 1st, because February 1st is also in bulk, uh, which I'll have Michael tell you about now uh, using an excerpt from the Green Stone. So Michael, I'm going to drop that in Twitter for you. Okay. Imbolc. One of the four main pivot points of the Celtic calendar, one of four ancient fire festivals of the year, and a day long believed to hold supernatural significance. February 1st was also one of the eight grand sabbats of the witch cult. Sabbat? Sabbats of the witch cult. Uh, The two men were concerned. Investigators of the paranormal rather than witnesses to it, both were aware that their credibility as objective paranormal researchers would be called into question by such claims. They therefore endeavored to find further witnesses in case the smoke appeared again or there were other paranormal events. Their story was too fantastic, too incredible, they felt, and that to be believed to be by fellow investigators. For these guys in general. Uh, that night, Martin came over again mm. at around 7.30, and he was there, and he witnessed the radio on the mantelpiece float up into the air and crash into the record player without any explanation. Uh, we talked about that maybe, I think, once before. Uh, they were spooked uh, because that happened, so at about 8.30, after spending an hour trying to figure out what the fuck happened, they decided to head down for the, like, just to the pub for a little while. They were like, we're like freaking out. We just need to go have a drink. Uh, but they were still afraid that somebody might be watching them, so they left a light on so people would still think somebody was in while they were out. Uh, They left at 8.30, got back at 11, uh, and they came back to find the light off and the front door wide wide open. And they came in to the house, and the power was completely out in the house, uh, Mm. fully out. And so they called Marion uh, on the phone uh, with candles lit. And before they could really chat, the smoke came back and sort of like forced them into the kitchen because that's where the smoke wasn't. Uh, and when they got inside, they saw that there was this crazy, like dark blue jellyfish like substance covering everything in the kitchen. And it's just one thing after the n- another with them. Marion's on Do the phone. Do they explain what the jellyfish like? Sub- was it ectoplasm? What are mm. they saying it is? I would have yeah. put, put a little tip of the tongue on it and give it a little taste. They couldn't identify it. They couldn't <laughs> have identify. sort of I a also, bleachy smell. Like. Yeah. <laughs> I also like want to. So just while you're talking about all this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is the assumption then that all the stuff that's happening to them is because of the evil team? Yeah. Or is this something else? It's like a it's like hmm. an indirect psychic attack where you're like sending bad vibes hard towards some people, but you're gonna find out why this is so easy for them in just it's a moment. psychic war, Jesse. Come on, man. No, no, I, I get that. I get that. But I don't know, like okay, just imagine the four right. of us are in a psychic war, okay. right? Yeah. We're, mm-hmm. we're mentally battling it out right now. Sure. What is the what is the tactic of making a radio float? Like this will mess them up. Like why do that? Just to you sow, know what I mean. Just to sow discord. Unless it's just a byproduct of psychic warfare. Like, oh, I'm not afraid of your technology. I'll make it float. Yeah, like, yeah. I, I I don't know how I don't know how directly targeted it is. I think it's just them like praying every night. I turn it into Beetlejuice at that point and just start having a dance party with floating shit uh-huh. all over the place. Like if yeah. you just pray to these gods, like, hey, please go fuck up their shit. Like I think that's what it's like. And so I am like, dear Imhotep. That's right. That's <laughs> yeah. the god I've chosen. <laughs> sure. Imhotep. Imhotep. Sure. That's right. Dear the mummy. Yeah. Go over there. Mess up. And 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 he's like, I'm on it. And now I'm the evil malevolent god, and I'm over there, just like float radio, goo mm-hmm. walls. Like, yeah. bro, kill a person. Do something. Well, like they planted a knife for him to use, but then they found it and buried it. So it's not like, oh man, I gotta, I gotta work with what's here. Oh yeah, he calls, he calls up. He's like, I thought you guys left me a knife. 
No, right. dude, we did leave you a knife. Where is it? I think they buried it. Are you kidding me? Oh, I just got enough juice to throw their radio. <laughs> all right, all right. And then, he's like, then he's like pulls his pants down and shits all over the table. It's like, what do you got? Uh, yeah. I got goo. <laughs> yeah, you get shit. I, got, shit I can make goo, the okay? radio float. Speaking of whoever the fuck did this, Marion's on the phone. She's telling them she's seeing visions of two shady dudes, one bearded, one clean shaven and bald, who are both wearing all black. She tells them that they're still around somewhere and that they should leave the house immediately. But the group at the house decides they didn't want to leave all this paranormal evidence behind. It's too valuable. So they made a double circle of chalk around themselves and a circle of salt around that. And then they barricaded the doors of the room they were in and they just started settling in when they noticed that they smelled something weird. And they looked over at Andy and his fucking coat had like started to catch on fire. They'd be and, like, uh, ripped ass. Yeah, and they, they, they smothered the fire quickly, but it filled them with determination to like defeat this evil force and outlast it. So they still continued doing what they were doing. They busted out the sleeping bags. They were going to tough it out over the night. Things were uneventful after that until they fell asleep. But at some point in the middle of the night, they woke up panicking because now Andy's entire sleeping bag was on fire, like fully burning. And uh, they got him out and into cold running water, double confirmed that all the candles were still away and put out. But he was pretty burnt, especially on his fingers. And I actually have a picture of Andy and his sleeping bag. If you want to see it, I'm going to drop that uh, here for you guys to see in the Twitter for you guys. Yeah, okay. That is a man holding a burnt sleeping bag uh, looking. Mm -hmm. The only pretty expression I can, I can say is baffled, perhaps. And who would just burn a sleeping bag for clicks? Uh, did he Honestly. write a book after this? <laughs> Uh, I've got it right here. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Who would cry on camera for clicks? I mean, come on. I don't know. No. Uh, what? Yeah. I don't well, know. The thing I, is, like, there's no way a sleeping bag could be burned or shredded normally. No, so. no. Yeah. Not it's like hard. that. That's like not like that. supernatural intervention. It's hard to say what's true. You know, it's hard to say. Mm -hmm. uh, next morning, they got the power back on. And as they called to check in with everyone on the team, things were looking pretty bad all around. Terry's wife was up literally obsessing over Graham and Andy at the headquarters and worrying about them making herself physically ill. Uh, Martin's mother found footprints leading out of the woods and up to her car without anybody, without any footsteps heading back the other direction. Uh, Gaynor's psychic presence impression was warning her that this evil force affecting them had only had one goal, which was to destroy their ability and confidence in each other to come together and use the green stone effectively. That's the best way to defeat them because if they can't use the stone, that's the second best thing to them not having the stone, right? So that Sunday, 7 p.m., they all separately concentrated on the stone for five straight minutes as she held it in her hand. And at 7.05 p.m., Gaynor smiled, handed her mother the stone, and told everyone that the psychic attack was over. No one knew if she was right, and she wasn't right. But that was the best they could do for now. So time went on, and the attacks slowed down for a little bit. Uh, but then something really interesting happened, because for one person, the pieces weren't adding up. On March 3rd, 1980, Marion Sutherland, uh, Gaynor's mother, had had enough. Something seemed off to her about the story of the Nine just disappearing after the gunpowder plot, and as she started to look at more and more details of Graham's story, she started to get this sort of strong psychic hunch that they didn't have the facts exactly right. And the more she thought about it, the more she decided she wanted to have the authenticity of the casket and the sword they did, that they discovered reconfirmed by an expert. So she went back to the Grosvenor Museum in Chester to meet with the assistant curator, Dan Robinson. And strangely enough, it was the result that no one expected. The casket that held the green stone was indeed of the proper medieval origin that it should have been. But the supposed sword of Meonia that they'd found which was hinted at by the Nine Worthies mural from Packington and which Gaynor used to correctly discover the location of the properly medieval casket that they found. They found out that this sword was somehow, upon closer inspection, only about 100 years old, placing it in the, in the realm of the 1870s, 1880s. Okay. Uh, and when they looked into it further, like I said, the tower, this is, what, this is the point where they find out that the tower where Gaynor saw the swan wasn't old enough to have been around during the gunpowder plot either. So now the only conclusion they could come to, uh, you know, and honestly, if this was me, this would be me being like, well, this whole shit was fake, right? And that's yeah, like, obviously, yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. On, that, I'm yeah. on that. I'm yeah. on that road right now. But 
Marion is a psychic and she's been having these yeah. psychic impressions about this this whole time. So she knows that at least something that's happening is correct. And so she comes to the conclusion that actually it wasn't a mistake, but that there was actually a Victorian version of the nine as well that was playing custodian to the stone throughout that whole time period and leaving their own psychic messages to guide the right people to the stone in their time of need. That maybe after they hid the stone at Packington uh, at, at, with Harvington Hall and stuff, that this version of the nine got it and then added some of their own things to the mix to hide the stone again, right? So okay. with that, I know what you're thinking. If the nine survived, why would they hide the stone? Like why, if the nine made it, why would they need to continue to keep the stone hidden rather than grab it and use it to defeat evil like they should, right? So yeah, when uh, Marion told yeah. Gaynor her suspicions, Gaynor agreed uh, and added that she felt something terrible had happened to this group of people uh, since then that wiped them all out. And she and later Alan Beard, who was now regularly having these Gaynor style visions after his own UFO encounter on the road, both saw the last members of the order in a vision being stabbed and poisoned and hiding the stone to protect it from evil forces trying to obtain and use it. And they weren't sure. But they also got the impression that maybe at the time of their destruction, the Nine may have been led by a woman, the same one Marion had seen with, quote, agitated hands last episode at the UFO conference. So some stuff was starting to come together, and it makes sense why Marion was starting to, like, not believe what was going on, because she was starting to have these other visions of this Victorian woman, and it was just not adding up. So this, is, this was good that she went and figured this out. In the days following all the members of Parasearch, having been granted a break from the attack, we're now experiencing the emerging presence of this woman, a.k.a. Joanna, a.k.a. the White Lady, a.k.a. possibly Guevara, a.k.a. possibly Mary, Queen of Scots, or possibly some other Mary, until finally it came to a head in September. And now Mathis will tell you what happened. The four of them sat in the room, clearing their minds to enable the woman to communicate. Suddenly, Graham saw a strange image of an Egyptian-looking building, like an ancient tomb, situated in a garden. He saw two sphinxes, between which ran a corridor with, wing with a winged sun disk carved above the entrance. He knew that this building was somewhere in the Midlands, although this seemed preposterous. English is hard. Yeah. There could, not, uh, there could not possibly be such a building anywhere in England, but the image remained, and he knew that it was connected with the secret society in Victorian times. He then saw a woman and the name Mary Heath came into his mind. He felt it was she who had been in charge of the secret society. Yeah, so this weird Egyptian sphinx situation seemed absolutely insane to literally everyone, and Marion made yeah. it seem even crazier by insisting that it was on a path flanked by redwoods and pine, which are definitely not trees that you imagine in Egypt. Uh, but immediately, this guy Graham knew, a man called Mike Ratcliffe, who worked for the Parks Department, recognized it from the description as Biddulph Grange, which was just nearby. And here is a picture of it that I'm going to send you guys in the chat right now, uh, just to prove that it's not made up. Uh, but if you Google image search this place, Biddulph Grange, you can see for yourselves just how nuts it is. Uh, supposedly, this place served as something like the headquarters for the Nine back in Victorian times. And indeed, it was built with these strange M8M symbols over the doors that seemed to could that could possibly reference Meaniah for Mary. And they asked around, and they found the place really was owned by a Robert Heath, whose daughter was named Mary. And though they couldn't quite receive her message, they knew it had come through soon. So while I was going through that, did you guys have a chance to look at Biddle's Grange? And would you give the people a little, a little, uh, vibe on the place it's like a it's like a if you made an egyptian temple out of hedges yeah, yeah. Kind of like perfect with, with, a, with a big uh arch gate there and like yeah two very slumpy looking sphinxes yeah so this is actually a real place it's super crazy it doesn't seem like it should exist if you take the name from that site and you take it and you put it into Google Images, like I say, you'll see there's like all this other crazy shit there. There's like this kind of weird sort of like Chinese looking area near the water. Yeah, I was trying like, to. Yeah, you guys started with Egyptian stuff and I'm looking at this and it seems it definitely doesn't read Egyptian to me. You, yeah, you can't really see the Egyptian stuff very well from the outside except for that one angle that i gave you with the with the sphinxes guarding the like very egyptian doorway and the little 
the shrubbery mm-hmm. pyramid coming over the top. Well, yeah, yeah, you see the shrubbery pyramid. That's yeah. that's what makes it. That's so Egyptian. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, in our limited capacity to but understand. I mean, if you imagine, right, like the Victorian England secret society occult vibe that you'd see in something like Hellboy or something, mm-hmm. you can kind of imagine that this type of place would absolutely exist in England. And it, in fact, does. So that's pretty nuts. Um, but yeah, and it and all the names matched up with what they had and everything was kind of falling into place again. And uh, on Tuesday, November 16th, 1980, things finally did uh, come to a head when Penny Blackwell had a vision, which Jesse will relate to you now. Mm. Uh, it is called Penny's Vision. There it is. On Sunday, 16 November 1980 at 1.30 p.m., Penny Blackwell had a vision of a large house and a bearded man who, by his clothes, must have lived there during the Victorian era. She knew there was something very wrong about this man and that she must immediately tell Terry. As she sketched her impression, she saw him again, but now he stood next to a fire. She felt that he meant danger for all and wrote those words besides her draw- beside her drawing of the man. She then sensed that he meant to destroy someone. and She began to write down the impressions as they flooded in, accompanied by further sketches. She knew this was of great importance to them all. The scene then changed, and she saw robed figures, which at first she thought were monks, then followed a woman dressed in in old-fashioned clothes, who she recognized as the same person she had seen standing beside the lake. In the distance, a dog was barking. There were people standing in a circle with one in the center. She knew they were in an underground chamber somewhere with gold-colored plates and other artifacts placed around the circle. A sudden horror overcame her. She saw that they were making the wrong moves, and that there was great danger of them being destroyed. Penny quickly wrote it all down, then dated it, uh, dated and signed it to give to Terry. She had no idea what it meant, but it was imperative that he should have it. Her insistence that this was vital prompted him to see Graham on Tuesday, 18 November. So this is where things kind of kick into overdrive again. After they had all met up that day and Terry decided to fashion a makeshift Ouija board from stuff around the house and hold a seance at 9.30 p.m. First thing they asked was if Penny's message that she received in her dream was important and the glass just kept spelling yes, 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 Y-E-S, Y-E-S over and over again. So then they started asking more questions, which I'll have Michael read for you now. Uh, There's going to be two pieces of this picture michael that i'm going to send you so get ready for part one to come through and then part two will come through right after it q do you have something to tell us a yes q has it to do with this underground place that penny and gainer saw yes where is it wolverhampton uh terry then felt that the underground chamber was near the old house where penny said the bearded man had lived the glass confirmed this Q, was his house in Wolverhampton, too? Yes. Whereabouts? It was a school. What is the name of the school? The Catherine Geeney School. Genie School? I don't know. Yeah. Is it a school now? No. To their amazement, the glass spelt out that the school once stood in Oaks Crescent. This was surely too incredible to be true. (coughs) Excuse me. But it could be checked. Question. Was the underground place that Penny saw below the school? A. Nearby. Then they asked if it was correct that the ceremony took place in a cellar in or near Oaks Crescent, and if it involved Mary Heath. It answered yes. But could this be correct? The glass repeated that it was so. Question. When was this ceremony? Answer, the 22nd of November, 1875. They then asked where exactly the cellar was, but the answer was unclear. However, it did say that something terrible had happened there, which brought about the end of the order. They must, it said, now put this wrong to right in order to release the power of the stone. They must go to the place and banish the evil guardian that held this power. Yeah, so... If you remember, Oaks Crescent, 19 Oaks Crescent is literally where Parasearch HQ is. Uh, so 
Next, they literally asked if it was the seller under Graham's apartment. And, well, they probably said flat, but you know Mm -hmm. what I mean. Uh, And the answer was yes, in 1875, and that their being there now was no accident. Uh, And here's some pics of the seller uh, underneath Graham's apartment, underneath the Paris Search HQ, this old Victorian building that I've been hyping for several years now. Here's some pictures of the seller, so you guys can kind of describe that to people. Um, dropping them into the Twitter now for you guys. Looks spooky. Yeah, it looks like a fucking Eurojank horror game yeah. from 2018. Oh, um, yeah, that's horrifying. Yeah. That's a serial killer basement right I there. Mean, I, I that's could, John Wayne Gacy's floor. I, mean, floor yeah, I could right give there. a description, but it would spoil the movie Barbarian. Uh, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't even know. I don't think I've ever heard of that's that. That's okay, Matthew. Yeah. You got a lot more to watch before you get to Barbarian. That movie came out like last year. Yeah, it's, it's, like, it's like a spooky wine cellar with like some cables going into it and. Yeah. yeah, and it's the cellar for the whole building, not just Graham's apartment, obviously, right? Mm-hmm. It's like not a private place just for him, but it is underneath his building, which is crazy. Uh, and he was confused when he found that out, explaining that it couldn't be destiny that he lived there because he picked the place out himself. But as Mathis will now read for you, here was the thing's response. A little bit more seance, a little bit more seance for you in the in the in the Twitter. Can you remember how you found it? The glass answered. Yes, a girl I knew whose brother lived there was moving out and she told me about it. Your meeting with her was no coincidence, it answered. Mind blow. Graham removed his finger from the glass and sat back. This was too much. Terry then asked if it had all begun to happen because they had taken the Oaks Crescent flat. Yes, it answered. They had been chosen and the circumstances had been created to permit them to move into the flat. Graham objected, saying this was going too far. He refused to continue. Jane uh, then asked a question. Was this power held because of the ceremony going wrong? Yes, was the answer. Terry then asks, was it to do with the bearded man who Penny thought destroyed them? Yes. Who was he? John Lang. Who's John Lang? It answered that Lang was a black magician through whom all the power of the evil one in caps was wielded in 1875. How did he manage to destroy them? It answered, they made incorrect moves. Yeah, which is basically the same thing that he said earlier. It explained that they had to banish evil from the cellar and that it would leave instructions with Marion on what to do. Uh, When they called her, she said she just had a vision of an eight-pointed star and, quote, an underground passageway bricked up with rubble. Uh, Back on the Ouija board, Mary said that it was an eight-pointed star of Michael and that they could banish evil with it. She also explained that on November 22nd, 1875, they had all gotten together against Lang, who was the leader of the evil team at this time. Uh, Basically, the physical form on Earth of the evil one, because as Mm. you know, evil always concentrates its power as an entity Uh, rather than good, which shares it among all. Uh, But they they were afraid uh, to face Lang, and they were too weak, and they didn't think that they would be able to use the green stone. Uh, properly because it's such a powerful artifact so instead they tried to fight lang with their own magic and this silver cross amulet that was passed down from leader to leader of the order of Meaniah or the nine uh and they failed and the cross was destroyed and the energy essence of that cross was distributed in the in the uh in the basement uh and they died and they failed Um, And they asked about Packington's original sword, and they asked about what the UFO sightings had to do with everything, but you wouldn't talk about anything besides cleansing the cellar. So they went to the other room, and they followed Marion's instructions on the phone. They started to draw on the floor. They drew the eight-pointed star on the floor, and somehow Andy and Alan had already had holy water and a rosary on them in their cars. Uh, because of some of sort of happiness. It's good to have that on you at yeah. all times, just in case. Just in case! They were psychically compelled. They were psychically mm. compelled to place in their cars. I, I, like, I like that it wouldn't talk about anything else but cleansing the cellar, and they found out, like, no, the, the landlord is actually psychic. She wants you to clean the cellar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can you just clean up some of those wires? Yeah. They're yeah. very dangerous. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they made a circle of salt. They called upon the Archangel Michael. They went down into the cellar and they read the words that Marion gave them. I'm going to send this to all three of you and then you guys can try and say it all at once. I'm going to drop this in the chat uh, in, the, in the stream. I have this right here for you guys. You guys can like count to three and say it all together. I'll, I'll do a three, yeah. two, Great. one, Love and then it. we'll go. Okay, here we go. Three, two, one. 
Archangel Michael. 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 I adjure thee in the name of the blessed 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 virgin. By her her holy holy body. By her sacrificial body. By by her (laughs) sacrificial soul soul to come forth. To come come forth. forth. I I ask ask thee by all all of the holy names. Holy names bring thy legions of angels. Bring thy legions of angels. Bring that legions of angels. That was maybe the greatest thing that I've ever done. And <laughs> apo- apologies to Dean in, in, in advance for that one. No, no, no. There's no syncing that Enjoy up. Enjoy syncing that up. Apologies to Dean. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I had to match Jesse's tone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, I figured yeah. we all do like, so. a, like a hello, hello, hello. Like we do like a whole like, you know, we're always oh, like, oh, in, yeah, it we're was like in Life of Brian when they're like, no, no, yeah. no. I, I, I'm sorry, Alex. I can't stop thinking about this. That second picture you sent of the the, the cellar. Basement. There's something, yeah. There's something on there that's it's probably just like a scratch on the film, but it looks like a column of light coming off of an item that I need to interact. Like with. on the floor. Uh, yeah, I uh-huh. totally like, see that. Oh, I bet I can pick this up and add it to my inventory. Maybe it's a save yeah. point. I don't know. It's a bullet. It's like a. It's like twenty five mm-hmm. bullets for your handgun. Yeah, in Resident exactly. Evil. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I totally see that. Uh, immediately upon doing this chant. They felt something in the cellar dissipate, and on the phone, Marion explained that now the stone's power was unlocked, uh, the, and the power from the cross was unlocked, and once again, you can now charge the stone to full strength. A little while later, Gaynor had a dream that she found a silver cross necklace that she'd lost years before, something of her own uh, from her childhood, and the woman in the white flowing gown that had been ac- appearing to her came and told her that when she woke up, this necklace would act like a radio. Uh, without explaining what that would mean. And when she woke up, she was somehow holding the cross in her hand for real. And she knew that the cross of Mary Heath and the power that was within it had now transferred into Gaynor's cross and that it would serve as the key to time and life for Mm. recharging the stone. And books. That's right. And (laughs) mysteries of the unknown. (laughs) Uh, That Christmas... uh, Graham was spending his holiday in North Wales with the Sunderland family for a few days. Uh, when he was struck rather suddenly one night with some new information, which Jesse will read for us now. I'm going to drop that into the Twitter for you. Boxing Day 1980 was to bring new answers. That night, Graham experienced a vivid dream in which he saw what he took to be the Pharaoh Akhenaten lying on a stone slab in an underground chamber adorned with hieroglyphics. In his headband was a small green stone. The Meonia Stone. Is that how we're pronouncing this? Meonia, Meonia, whatever sure. you want to say. Around the slab stood a number of small white pyramids. A procession filled, filed into the chamber, each person picking up a pyramid and making their way from the tomb along a stone corridor. As he dreamt, he had the impression that the center of learning, Akhenaten, had fallen to their adversaries followers of the Amon religion. Akhenaten's people knew this and were preparing to leave for Britain with the stone and these nine small pyramids. What they were, Graham did not know, but as he awoke, the words, the nine lights, were still clear in his mind. And this is the part that made me late with this script. Here we go. After consulting with Gaynor, using some automatic writing... They were informed that these pyramids represented the nine aspects of the Greenstone's power and that the nine lights were hidden around Britain at nine sacred megalithic cultural sites for them to unlock and reabsorb into the stone so that it could finally destroy the evil one, which it literally hadn't been power- powerful enough to do since literally the times of Akhenaten. They began their search for the first four lights on New Year's Day 1981 At each site, there was supposedly going to be an unwitting guide that Gaynor would be able to physically identify, uh, or at least send them to the location where they're going to find their unwitting guide, uh, who would possess some special knowledge, enabling them to summon that location's spirit guardian, which would then give its energy to the stone. And once they have all nine, they're good. I'm going to go through these pretty quick, because it's pretty wild stuff, so bear with me. Once they have all nine, they're good. They're good. Trust me. They're good. 
Uh, first light was in Oxfordshire near Dorchester at the Dorchester Abbey. They had seen a vision of a sleeping man and a stained glass window that looked like the Hebrew tree of life. And when they got there, they saw that the sleeping man was actually a statue. Following a clue about walking along the path of some ancient earthworks to the, quote, waters of Isis, they came upon a riverside hut with a lock keeper inside, like a guy who is the keeper of the lock a.k.a. like the lock, like a river lock. He told them that this part of the Thames was called the Isis, and that recently he'd read a legend of buried treasure in a hill fort nearby that was guarded by a raven. The next day, they went out there, the wind whipped up around them when they called for the guardian, and tons of ravens flew away, calling as they felt energy flowing into the stone, one light down. That's Dorchester. Next one was at the Uffington White Horse, which is a huge 375 foot long uh, Celtic chuck carving from 100 BC near Uffington Castle. Holding the stone and walking the site, they were directed towards a 5,000 plus year old earth mound called Wayland Smithy and the small chamber inside of Wayland Smithy. They called for the guardian and with the sound of hundreds of galloping horses, they thought they'd had it, but it didn't feel energized like last time. Weird. Next day, they figured they needed some sort of guide that they missed finding the guide person that they were supposed to find. Uh, And coincidentally, as they were coming back that day, they ran into, in the parking lot, the forest warden and his son. The warden was new to the area. He just started his job. He didn't know much. But the little kid was like, by the way, I know this cool story, Uh, which, you know, is the hallmark of a good fantasy tale where, of course, from the mouths of from the mouths of babes, as they say. He told this story about how there's a buried treasure <clears throat> up there that you find by kneeling Penitent. Um, on top Penitent. of the mound and bowing Penitent. three times. Bef- yeah. You bow three times, then you ask help from the elf guards. Uh, they did not believe in elves for some reason. After uh, all this stuff had happened, they were like, no, we don't believe in elves. But they believed in the process. And when they went and did it, sure enough, the wind whipped up again, and the second light entered the stone. They felt it. They knew it was there. They felt it good. This is just the Castlevania third light, too, man. Come on. Yeah, literally <laughs> literally that one part from <laughs> Castlevania 2 where you go to the left. Mm-hmm. Uh, third light was at the thousands of years old Avabury Stone Circle near Marlborough Downs. If you want me to butcher more places from the middle of England, just let me know. Here's a little bit of history about the place uh, from the Greenstone book from Michael to read. Uh, I'm going to send that to you now. In 1742, Dr. William Stukeley, a noted antiquarian, made an engraving of the site as it then looked. He saw that it represented the solar serpent formed by the circle and two avenues of stone stretching for more than a mile each to the southeast and southwest. The southeast avenue ends in a stone circle 130 feet in diameter called the Sanctuary on top of Overton Hill. Sadly, the Second Avenue no longer exists. Stukely considered that the site represented the solar serpent of the ancient Egyptians, a symbol representing the highest ideals of inner truths and the supreme creative being. Graham and Andy could see why the Egyptians had chosen the monument as a location to hold the third light. En route to the circle, Graham held the stone and had the vague impression that a stampede of horses was involved with the summoning of this particular light. No idea why there's like a weird horse stampede situation going on with these lights. Uh, But as they were parking, Andy realized that he actually came here before uh, when he was driving the Avis family around, the abducted uh, alien abducted family. He was talking about their abduction and taking them to like powerful megalithic sites. And he actually brought them here a few years before. And John A remembered suddenly in the, in the moment that John Avis told him that one day the woman who worked at the bar at the inn would help him with something important that he needed to do. So before heading to the pub and investigating that Graham was like not letting go of the fucking horse stampede thing. So he went into the gift shop and he was like, has anybody heard anything about stampeding horses around here? And amazingly, the guy at the shop said that the only person who would probably have that story for him was a woman named Heather Garland who worked at the bar at the inn. So now they went to go talk to her. She said one night when she was out riding her horse, she witnesses a ghost stampede that rode right through her. They go out to exactly where she saw the horses and they stood there. Suddenly, a piece of information comes into Graham's mind. He knows that the energy spot was between the two specific stones in the village. 
He goes back there to call the Guardian. Pretty soon, the third light's his in a whip of wind. My man's on a scavenger psychic hunt for psychic clues. That's three down. That's three down, yeah. Next morning, before heading out for the fourth light at Glastonbury Tor, Graham had the impression that he needed to invite Terry and Alan to meet them at Glastonbury Abbey nearby. Uh, When they got there, Alan realized that he'd seen this place in his dream last night, and that at the foot of the tour was a house that they needed to visit to meet their guide. When they got there, they found the perfect spot from his dream just as he dreamed it, a place called St. Michael's Cottage. After the ancient church, St. Michael's Church, which was barely standing anymore, I think at the top of it's even open now, it's so old, at the top, it's at the top of the tour, which is like a big hill, basically. Uh, the young girl who answered the door told them of a phoenix at the top of the tour. And when they got up there to the last standing tower of St. Michael's Church, they weren't too surprised to find a carving of a phoenix on one of the walls. The wind blew so hard they almost rolled down Glastonbury towards grass-covered terraced hillsides, but they didn't, and the fourth light was theirs. Part one of the quest done. They took it back to Penny Blackwell a few days later, and as she held the stones in her hands, they swear they watched it as it got greener and warmer and heavier and bigger in front of their eyes. In the break between quests for the lights, something strange happened also uh, that seemed insidious at first. Martin and his neighbor Carol Taylor both had an encounter with a strange dark figure near where they lived. And in the days uh, after both had dreams about him and the phrase Pastor John, and they thought that that meant maybe that they was talking about John Lang. Uh, So here's a quote about Martin's dream where he ran into the man again at night uh, walking his strangely sinister jaw, uh, dog, and we're going to have Mathis read that one. Boxing Day 1980 was to bring new answers. That night, oh, Graham one. experienced a vivid dream in which he saw... No, the next what one. He, oh, what? There's, no, there's one there after one? that. Oh, oh, there it is. Yep, sorry. It didn't pop up. The face was a black, empty mask. Neither he nor the dog made a sound as they walked. Martin's nerve broke. Never had he moved so quickly. Looking back, he saw the figure turn for a fourth and last time. In seconds, he was home, his heart thumping as he bent forward, gulping air as he stood outside the house. But why had he run? He knew the figure was not real, an apparition, a ghost, but surely he should have stayed and watched, gone over to it. But no, never before had he experienced a psychic vision, and even investigators get scared. That night he slept well, untroubled by the experience. He knew it had been a vision, in retrospect something he should not have feared, but for him to have such a vision, it must have meant something. Maybe this is the truth of what will happen if Jesse ever sees a ghost. He claims he'll be all brave and go up to it, but he'll run away <laughs> and <laughs> scream. <laughs> you think I'm going I'm to shaggy this thing or like Scooby? Yeah. Just jump up and run in the air for a second. <laughs> yeah. And then, then I like my feet spin. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then you're gone and then a cloud of dust from where you right, stood right, in your right, form. Right, 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 right. But I somehow managed to take my whole giant 15 layer sandwich with mm-hmm. me yes oh well, yeah that's I mean, so that's what makes you aerodynamic while you're running <laughs> right it cuts the wind carol and martin compared notes what they had both seen was clearly the same martin had been leaving carol's house after visiting her brother when she happened to mention a strange dark figure she had seen on pyre hill lane quickly he asked her to say nothing more and for the first time revealed what he had seen carol's subsequent description tallied exactly pastor john the mysterious figure remained an enigma but in some way, Martin knew the man had a part to play, somewhere, somehow. In early February, Gaynor said that the search for the next four lights must soon start. Again, she was unable to undertake the search herself, but three others were available, Andy, Graham, and Martin. Yeah, and uh, so apparently Gaynor said that the next two lights, five and six, were going to be the same as the first four, but that the two after that required the passing of some kind of worthiness test before they're finally able to access the ninth light. Uh, so they resolved to do one thing at a time and not worry about that. This is, this is all fucking insane. This is more and more a video game as we go. <laughs> yeah, it's tight. Uh, the ninth right, and the final tight. one will hold a trial. When the mini bosses showed up. You're right. It is very tight. So first things first, off to the Devonshire town of Crediton to visit the Holy Cross Church. This time, as they search around the altar, they were surprised by a huge black dog that came up to them with a tag that said Temujin on it, which is the name of Genghis Khan. Uh, it bounded up to him and back and straight on the dog's heels like no 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 he's nice he's nice he's nice comes a guy named pastor john who's at the church so turns out this guy wasn't john lang just a man called pastor john they decided that temujin was the guide uh because pastor john seemed quite clueless and that he was sending them to the nearby village of 
Black Dog, where they went and started drinking beers at the Black Dog Inn. And as a bit, he called for the Guardian in the Black Dog Inn in Black Dog, which he was sent to by the Black Dog. And I kid you not, a black Labrador walked into the bar from outside, walked straight up to him and put his hand in his head, like his head in his hand. And he felt the warmth of the of the of the fifth light enter the stone. We off to Lidford Gorge for number six. <laughs> <laughs> Can't imagine why a black dog would be in the black dog pub. That's just... <laughs> are we in the DLC portion of the story? No, dude, this is main. This is you got to get all the bits. It's all main. Yeah, mm-hmm. you got to get all the bits, and yep. then you fight the bad guy. But there's the, reassemble the, the amulet. Is this a single player game or is this a live no, this is an RPG. game? Yeah. This is an RPG okay, okay. and he's going around. And here's the thing. You can collect party members or you can choose not to. Well, okay. Yeah. Jesse, as, since we're talking about video games right now, um, I wanted to, I wanted to reveal something else. You asked me two years ago, why I had Michael on for the green stone. Why I don't, did I bring Michael. I'm gonna let you know, if you tell us that he, is an ancestor of anyone in this story. I'm never coming back to no, the show. I would no. be very yeah, surprised. I'll walk I'll away. literally quit. I'll close the Patreon down right <laughs> will, now. So get over there right now. Patreon.com slash like, Illuminati pod. <laughs> quickly donate. I'll walk into the gone. ocean and let the tide take me. It'll be, I'll be gone. I'll, you'll never see since, me again. Is that like the movie, the, what was it? The movie, the boy where the doll and they, the, 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 the couple walks the into the boy? ocean to drown themselves. It's a horrible, oh horrible horror movie. And it, it's about like a doll that they take care of and they hire a babysitter and they're like, we're going on vacation. Can you just take care of this doll? Like it's our son. And she's like, yeah, easy money. And so it then cuts to the two old couple walking into the ocean, suicide drowning together. They die. And then a haunting starts only to find out that it's not a ghost, but their son never died. He's living in the walls and he's an old crazy guy now. And he was trying to kill the parents. And now he's trying to kill the baby. I need you to know Wow, that is a better story. (laughs) <laughs> than this no way the movie is the terrible and i have seen that one so i can't wait to the see what we get michael like on. let's keep going i'm in i'm in <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Right. The, the reason the reason i had michael on was because the like, i don't want to spoil it but it's because this is a video game what? he is the host of video game apocalypse and this this mystery is the most jrpg that a mystery has ever been. Yeah. You are not correct. I mean, you are not incorrect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So now that we are, so now that we're far enough in that you guys can just clearly see that it's a video game. That's why one more mystery solved. All um, right. okay. Off to Lidford Gorge for number six at the castle Inn in Lidford, an old man, they start talking to at breakfast, tells them a story about quote, a spectral cockerel that was supposed to guard an ancient earthwork on Brentor nearby. 100, I'm sorry, 1,130 feet above sea level. It's another tour uh, with another church also called St. Michael's Church or Brentor Church on top. They headed there right after breakfast and Graham had visions on his way of monks chanting in Latin. When they got to the church, they tried the chanting, even though they didn't really know what they were saying because they don't speak Latin, but it didn't work. And so they kept looking until they found somewhere else in the church, the words that they were saying. And those words were on a bell in the bell tower and they checked the guidebook to read about the bell and they were actually able to find the translation uh to the words on the bell which may be the best single thing that i've ever had jesse read out loud on the podcast here is what the latin on the bell said here we go ready this is payoff for jesse this is the kind of stuff that jesse likes ready this is for me ah great um yeah i am called the cock and I alone sound above all. <laughs> and that's the Greenstone Part Three. I'll see you guys later. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, uh, but yeah, so I wouldn't. And honestly, I wouldn't even be surprised mm. if, we ended if it that there. was where I ended it. That's like what I wanted to do as a bit, but I, I would never do that. You did that's, it three that's times. Key. No, I did it. Every single piece of information. Every single piece of information that you have received in the Greenstone trilogy so far has been useful in enjo- in enjoying and understanding further parts that. of the trilogy. I mean, you are dead. You are correct in the very specific statement. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. They summoned the guardian below the tower, charged the stone, got the light. And as they left and they walked out of the church and back down the tour, they heard the cry of a single cockerel crowing out into the morning. How about that? Isn't that what nice? if they didn't know what a cockerel was? They were just then that's the adventure. A single 
cockerel. Well, they're English. They definitely know what a cockerel mm-hmm. is. Um, throughout the rest of the day and into the night after getting uh, up the, t- the tour early in the morning, uh, they drove to get the seventh light at Hurler Stone Circle at Dozemary Pool, which is near, uh, which Dozemary Pool is a lake near Bodmin Moor, so England, and stopped at a wild spot on the way called the Cheese Ring Hotel with a W in there. I'm not even going to tell you where the W is. Uh, they stopped at the Cheese Ring Hotel near the Dozemary Pool, which is a lake near Bodmin Moor. Uh, and while they were there, they received psychic instructions that the special test that they would have to pass was walking on foot right now in the middle of the night, the seven miles to Dozemary Pool from the hotel in the dead of night. Uh, they were very scared to go out into the bog at night. It was like very, very cold out. It's England. Uh, they had not the right outfits for going out into the night like that and through the bog and they had no equipment uh but they were thinking about it and they said god damn it you know what it has to be tonight people are depending on us the world is depending on us evil (laughs) will win if we don't do this so they resolved to go and make the trek out to dozemary pool in the middle of the night however the very moment that they all decided to make that choice together they felt the power of not just the seventh But also the eighth light right after enter into the stone and realize that the test was simply being willing to do what had to be done. How about that? Wow. Isn't that nice? It's a very forgiving test. The the moral of the story is be uh, perseverance. Have perseverance. Do what you do what you never quit. You know, it doesn't it doesn't matter if you didn't do a thing so long as you make it. (laughs) Yeah. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Which is uh, the the theme. That's the kind of the theme. Intentions are everything. Uh, so now they have eight lights. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's just actually a just an Adderall tab. Honest to God, that uh, would make so much sense. Before they could get the ninth light, uh, <laughs> they had to get Terry, Gaynor, <laughs> Martin, Marion, and Graham together at the Avebury Stone Circle on the night of Beltane, uh, one of the other, quote, old Celtic fire festivals, just like Imbolc, uh, which that year was on April 30th, 1981. At 9.30 p.m., they began, I don't know why I wrote began, but they began their ascent up the trail to the circle and wordlessly all took a strangely deliberate winding route up the hill together. Later, they found out that it was like some sort of mystical route that they that other people have been taking for years up there to like get the natural stuff in line before you go do stuff. I don't know. They felt really good after doing it and they didn't speak about doing it. They just all did it together at the top of the trail just as terry broke the silence with right, a good yeah. grief there was a huge flash of blue light that shone out from their bodies which sparkled and glowed for over a minute before fading away and suddenly they knew they had to go back to the uffington white horse which gainer was now calling quote the place of the dragon for the ninth light at dawn and here is a quote from the book about that for michael to read I'm going to okay. send into Twitter. Christian legends state that the Uffington White Horse is a representation of the dragon slain by St. George on Dragon Hill, a flat topped hill in the vale below. She had, many months before, told them that the secret of the Meonia Stone would only be known once the true significance of the dragon slaying legend was understood. So they went back up to the fort nearby and stood looking down at the horse. And with the break of dawn light coming into the stone, and to quote the book again one last time before we move into the final chapter of this story, the transformation was complete. An energy that had lain dormant for thousands of years was once again awakened, returned to the stone from which it had been taken so many centuries before. The power to slay the dragon was returned to the Meonia stone. Now everyone was feeling pretty good again. But there had been no further communication with the woman in white, so the urgency had died down a little bit in the time since. However, one night at a chill kickback the crew was having at Parasearch HQ, home of all parties, one of their normie friends called Karen suddenly passed out onto the floor. And everybody freaked out, and they went over and grabbed her and moved her into the bed so that they could like get her relaxed and laid out in the bed. And they were about to call a doctor, but just as they were calling the doctor, she bolted up and was smiling really creepily with a voice not her own, and said, quote, I am above you all. You cannot win. And then Karen suddenly woke back up uh, to normal and remembered nothing. And uh, 
basically that was the beginning of things starting to attach to people who weren't even involved with the Green Stone directly and following them home from Graham's apartment. Uh, a few days after Karen's possession, they heard some crashing sounds, but they were, they were having a hangout, chill zone, smoke sesh probably. Just kidding. I don't know. I made that up. Uh, but they were hanging out in the living room and they heard like crashing coming from the cellar where they had dispelled that spell thing and sound of heavy objects scraping the floor. And their buddy David went down because he was like, kind of like, I'll see what's going on. You guys are always the ghost hunter guys. I'll be the ghost hunter. And he went down to investigate and he had a weird interaction with something in the dark down there, which like stayed with him and tormented him and made him sick. And, his, and, and, and it followed him and his girlfriend and they went on vacation to Cornwall. And while they were out there, they were accosted by like a mist in the shape of a white, like a white mist in the shape of a male figure that was like terrorizing them on vacation. Uh, two other friends by the name of Barry and John came by on another occasion and the temperature dropped to bone chilling in the apartment and they were putting themselves by the fire and the fire wouldn't do anything to help them. Um, and the next day at home, mm. uh, after they left, Barry saw the same like black, thick, stinky smoke that was showing up at headquarters. And pretty soon, people just stopped coming to hang around because of stuff like this. Because the the word was, if you go there, it's bad. You shouldn't go there. Nobody was going there. Even the tenant upstairs had to leave because they were so depressed and it smelled so bad. And then another tenant came, and they also left. And things were getting real bad in this building. And Graham. Uh, was also uh, constantly assaulted all the time with sounds in the night that scared him and interrupted his sleep. And he started having visions of a man in Victorian dress that was dark and scary and huge and a woman wandering the house in contemporary clothing. And even a few times he saw the specter of an Egyptian priest wandering around his house fairly regularly until uh, in May of 1981, when Martin, Terry, Alan, Graham, and Pat met together to figure out what the fuck was going on. Uh, they were trying to have a meeting at the HQ, and things got so bad, and the evil vibes were so overwhelming, and it got so cold that they literally left. They literally left, and Terry was like, please come stay with us tonight, Graham. This is crazy. And he was like, no, I'm going to fucking stay here. And then he like stayed for a little while, and then he heard this like weird, like, and like, and like, got up and fucking left and just like ran and was like, you know what? I will sleep at your house tonight. Thank you very much. That's very good. I love that. And after that night, basically the idea of a common meeting place for the Parasearch team was dead. Uh, Graham and Martin were the only ones who ever still met there. Uh, and even them, one day, thick smoke, an overwhelming spell of rotten meat that stayed for hours and hours until they were literally so grossed out by the rotten meat smell that they were they just couldn't stay in the office anymore for any amount of time. Even Graham moved out, moved in with uh, one of the investigators, Jane, just like lived in her other bedroom. Uh, there was still a year left on the lease, but nobody could get any use out of the building because right after they vacated it, the power went out for good. The city engineers came to try and fix it. They were baffled uh, and much too quickly for a house its age over the next few months, it began to literally collapse from inside. There was plaster that was like folding in half and falling off the walls. The floor of the house started to rot away. The pipes were rusting and bursting. And it started to look like mm -hmm. the cellar in the house. And Graham Phillips said, quote, it was almost as if time in the building was passing at an accelerated rate. Uh, and also another much more clear quote in which he said, Parasearch as an organization was finished. So nobody was there anymore. They had no headquarters. Nobody wanted to hang out together anymore. And uh, things started happening. Erratic behavior of strangers. Their family started acting weird. Their friends started having problems. There was this overwhelming psychic malaise over everything. People began breaking off from the group for good. Alan had a lady friend who suddenly started like abusing him and beating the shit out of him all the time until he had to like end it with her. Uh, Penny Blackwell uh, was at home one night and a man came to her door Damn. in all black and threatened her not to hang out with the group anymore. Uh, another guy, Terry, was driving home with his daughter from school and a man tried to run him off the road. And so it was getting like too real for people, right? Like it was like their fun hobby of psychically questing along the countryside and they're having a grand time finding ancient Egyptian shit and having a fun time. And all of a sudden, People are getting hurt. Things are starting to happen that are affecting their real lives. They're not getting sleep anymore. So they just kind of like over time, over months, just gravitated away 
<clears throat> people were dropping like flies. Even Graham and Jane themselves stopped being involved. And the only people left by the end, literally the only people left were the Sunderlands, the, the second UFO family with Gaynor and Marion. And amazingly, uh, they never gave up. And Gaynor had one last vision, uh, which echo division she had before, where she found herself on the top of a hill next to an oak tree with a gap in the middle near the bottom and the lady in white beside her saying that this was where they would all meet and defeat evil. And it turned out that Gaynor decided to call everybody one last time just to see, just to be like, hey, fuck it, fuck all this, let's get together, let's finish this, let's end this, let's do this, right? One last try. Turned out when she started calling everybody that they had all had a similar dream of that same oak tree that they were talking about earlier. The only person who didn't have a dream like that and who did not show up uh, that day was Graham himself, the author of The Green Stone. And they all decided to meet at this place, which was called The Mount. It was two miles south of Bishop's Wood near Staffordshire. They got there. They saw the tree. They didn't know what to do, so they did what they always do. They held hands around it, and they thought really hard, and they had a vision of the White Lady's Priory uh, that came to them, and they knew that they had to go to the White Lady's Priory, and it seemed right to them because they believed that maybe the White Lady was the same White Lady from the White Lady's Priory, the lady that they've been seeing in white that's been coming to them. So they're like, okay, and they saw this vision of this mound <clears throat> next to the White Lady's Priory, and they, they, they were all clear together, and they were feeling hope again that this was the place where they were going to confront the evil again on Imbolc one year later and just end this for good. So they're all feeling really good, but Graham, the old leader of the Parasearch team, he was alone. And the day after they went to the, the tree, he had a crazy dream of his own where he got instructions from some entity to build a 3D version of the eight-pointed star of St. Michael. Uh, and so he got his friend Trevor, who was a good like maker of things, a handyman, and uh, he built it. He built it just like the instructions said. And when he called the group, they were like, you got the star? And he was like, what? Yeah, I did make the star. And he was like, okay, well, here's this. Let me tell you what I found out when I had my dream. This star and the eight points on it represent the eight pyramids of light that I saw a long time ago. The eight pyramids of light. One of the lights, it's green. One of the, one of the lights, it's red. One of the lights, it's yellow. One of the lights, it's blue. One of the lights, it's purple. One is orange, one's white, and one's black. And inside of the star was the ninth uh, point inside, which was covered in golden foil and was like the center of the power of all the nine lights. And on February 1st, they all had the same message. They were all to meet at the White Lady's Priory, bring the weird star thing, face down evil. So finally, just after things seemed like it was all going to shit, the power of the White Lady came to them all in their night and got them all back together on one mission one last time. And now I will take a break from this story just for a minute to take a segue over to a new paranormal investigator uh, that we're going to meet, a sort of uh, extra part of the story, a sort of Nick Fury-esque character, if you will, uh, who had just started hearing about Grand Phillips and Andy Collins and getting excited about the idea of being in an adventure group like that and not quite understanding the danger. And he was very uh, sort of bushy, blue, blue eyed and bushy tailed. Is that hmm. what they say? Yeah. Yeah. That's the saying. That's what they say. Yeah. So he has his own book now. Cause this is all happened now. This is all like, this happened in like eighties and nineties. So it's all long past now. He also has a book that's called the Chronicles of me and I, it's right here. I got it right here. And uh, oh, God. in his book, he opens his intro chapter on the green stone and his experience is pretty interesting because he met graham phillips for the first time after he had this dream with the star and with the white lady's priory and all that he meets him and so he runs he comes into this story at this point and he's like talking to graham and graham's like here's everything that's been happening uh they're just chatting in a pub and he's like i gotta go deal with this really soon and Joe is like, I love, I love, this is so crazy. Can I get involved? Can I be one of the nine? Can I go there on the day, sir, please, please? 
And he's like, no, this is too dangerous for somebody like you. But once I'm done, hopefully I'll come back and I'll have a great story to tell you about what happened. So that happened, little interlude for you. And now we're back. Graham, Phillips, February 1st, in bulk, everything coming together. And the plan they receive from the presence was for them to go to the mound near White Lady's Priory, uh, charge the star to like focus the power, uh-huh. and leave right. the stone there and move away to the safety of the Priory so that the White Lady herself can appear. And, you know, because she's so much more powerful and magical, she's going to use the stone. She's going to come and use the stone to destroy the evil once and for all, to manipulate the stone the fully charged stone, the first time it's been seen in thousands of years, send this energy into the evil one and end its existence. So they all follow the steps. It's all set. They gather the nine companions, Mike, Alan, Terry, Gaynor, Marion, Graham, Chris, George, and John. They charge the star with the energy they needed by placing it on the rise, overlooking everything. Everything was ready for the big moment. That night, Marion went out and placed the stone on the mound. And they were all there watching her from afar. And she started running away and caught up with them. And they all went into the priory with the star to wait for the magic to happen. They linked hands like they always do from the safety of the priory. And they focused on the star. But little did they know that the evil one had been listening <gasps> this whole time. The whole time, The evil one knew that they were talking with the white lady. And the whole time through the psychic power of the evil one and the white lady and the way that they communicate and the similarities between them, even though they're perfect opposites, the whole time he knew that the white lady would be the one who was going to the stone on the mound. And he knew, and he was going to be ready for her there to kill her before she got to the green stone. And he was ready there. And he was waiting for her out there that night. And he was waiting for her to go and pick up the stone. And that would be the moment that he would destroy her but he noticed that something wasn't right. The evil one wasn't, she, the white lady wasn't showing up. And he went to look at the stone and, wait a minute, that wasn't the stone? Was it possible? Was it possible? Had she really anticipated this? Had she really contacted Graham and Marion to tell them that the evil one had been listening the whole time and to switch out the stone at the last minute? Yes, it was possible. And that's what they did. And they had the stone in hand, all of them together in the Priory. And Graham got the sword of Mianaya out and he plunged it into the heart of the star, which supercharged it with the power of Mianaya. And here is a quote for what happened next for Mathis to read. A blinding light exploded from the wood, a massive flash tearing away the darkness, accompanied by an ear-shattering crash. Within seconds, there was another huge flare. The landscape lit up for hundreds of yards, pure white light as bright as the sun. A second crash followed, as a third circle of light erupted into view and for several seconds hovered over the copse itself, almost blinding them with its brilliance. Finally, a deafening cry tore through the woods as two spheres fused together, exploding like a thousand th- suns and bringing an impossible daylight. Then silence. Marion burst into tears. It was finished. She knew they had, she, they had succeeded. The destruction of the evil one had finally been accomplished. They knew indisputably that they had triumphed in their fated task. Hurrying away from the priory, they made for the cars, eager to escape from the cosmic battlefield. The age-old evil had been destroyed, totally and utterly, by the devastating power released by the Mionia Stone. And that, folks, is how you defeat evil in the real <laughs> world. The power of friendship and the, basically the same fake-out routine twice in a row, one time against God and one time against some witches. That's how you do it. Nice. Uh, now, is that, the, or is that the end of the story? That's the end of the story of the Green Stone. They defeated evil. They got together. They did it. Now, my question is to you, was this aliens? Was this, was this, was this a a disguised alien encounter? Was this genome engineering through the, through the lens of our own reality? Were these that, or was it something else? Remember the vision of the Arab man with the stones and the red light? And remember the seed of life? And remember the aliens saying that they are you and that they're going to lead us by watching us? 
and all this stuff. Like the UFOs never leave the story. And the, uh, I don't, <laughs> you know, it, I don't know. Like, I don't, could this yeah, just you know, be the greatest UFO story of all time? I, you know, wouldn't this you know be exactly how it would go? We have, we've made jokes in the past about a, like drunk, like backcountry aliens accidentally making their arrival on earth and mm-hmm. fucking with humans. Yeah. If there was ever a true story that that was it, it feels like this would have been them making them go on weird scavenger hunts for their own entertainment. Yeah. It, it's very, I don't, I don't know if this is an alien abduction story hidden as a JRPG. Yeah, alien game designer is like, oh, we wanted to test out the scavenger hunt <laughs> idea we had. And it's gonna be an escape room. It's going to be awesome. It's like, they're just like, dude, they showed up again. They, they haven't, mm-hmm. they, no, they, they're there. All right. I'll tell them to show up in London tomorrow night. Send them a fucking thing. Yeah, yeah. Right. This, this story is just the beginning of a grand tradition of occultists in England in the 70s, 80s, and 90s doing something called psychic questing. Uh, and this is random nodding. Yeah, it's it's I don't really know. I don't really know, like the mechanism behind it, if it's not a magical entity or an alien presence. Sure. Contacting them. But this this story that I've read to you today is the long and the short of the story around the green stone that everybody knows. This is the last scene. I, we just read the last scene in the real book. The story is over. We've waited. Credits. <laughs> Directed by Alex Fasciani, uh, <laughs> guest starring okay, I have Mathis, Jesse. guest starring Jesse Cox, guest starring Michael Raparez, uh, and special thanks to you. Uh, shout out to the Greenstone book. Shout out to the Eye of Fire book. Shout out to the Seventh Sword book. Shout out to the Chronicles of Meonia book. Shout out to, to uh, Flying Saucer this man magazine. Created a whole mm-hmm. ass world. Flying. Shout out to all that stuff. That's the credits. The credits are done. All rights reserved. Wait, what's this? More movie? Is that MCU? possible? A post-credit, post-credit scene? scene? <laughs> is that what's happening here? Hold oh, on a minute. Oh, is this going to be Wait. the lead into the Redstone? Fast forward. Fast forward. A few days later, Joe is waiting to meet Graham and Andy again after their chat in the pub before Graham went and did everything. And they're in great spirits. And they're like, hey, man what's up? We're, we did it. And he's like, dude, that's awesome. Can I join your group now? And they're like, dude, hell yeah, you can, you could join the group. And actually we're going back to white ladies priory right now to take some pictures. And, uh, if you want, you can jump in the car and come with us. So they rode out to there and they were looking at the sort of like aftermath of what had happened. Like it wasn't, uh, just something that was like a hallucination. Trees were down. There was like shit blasted everywhere. And uh, I have one last uh, piece of writing to read. This one's for Jesse. How dare you? I, I was and, already uh, like in... angry at you. All right, yeah. <laughs> and then and it's in the Twitter. We're, we're coming in in media rest to this scene. Gotcha. There isn't any blackness or charring on the trees, he stated. If the explosions had been a setup, there would surely have been some evidence of it. They were too big for normal explosions not to leave any evidence at all. I'm really amazed that there's no real physical damage. Terry tossed the branch to the ground, and we proceeded to make our way into the ruins of the Priory. Alan began to take some photographs. What are they for? I inquired. That's one of the voice. <laughs> oh! <laughs> what are they for? There's different characters here. That's the orc, the orc from Warcraft 1. Yeah, 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 writing a book yeah. about the green stone, Terry confided. What happened here will be included. Oh, that's got to be some story, I replied enthusiastically. It's going to be a story that people will find hard to believe, Terry said with a wry smile. But it happened, and it won't be long before you're a witness to what is occurring in the project. I looked out into the wood, thinking about Terry's last words, wondering what amazing events lay in store. For now, I was just glad to have become part of the group. Whatever lay ahead... I knew that I could not be with a nicer bunch of people, and with them, I felt ready to face anything that the unknown had to offer. This man's living my dream life, and I'm mad about it. Yeah, (laughs) and with that, we sunset the story of Graham and Andy. They fade into the background of this story. The green stone, it becomes just a bit player from here on out. More to come soon, but this story... Oh, no, there's more. (laughs) This story is done. All right, Mike, we'll see you back. No, no, Uh, no, no, wait, I'm not done. Let me make a promise to you right now. Okay. There will never be 
another episode of this show about the green stone. Cool. So cool. This so we it. already know you have a redstone book. We already are aware. No, no, yeah. <laughs> no. I'm not going to do an episode about the redstone either. I'm not going to do, I'm not going to point out that there's some very suspicious colors on that pyramid, uh, star, that star pyramid. I'm not going to point that out. Uh, two of the colors were just some of the seven or eight colors that made up all the points on that <laughs> pyramid. Is, I'm not going to talk about that. Is there, is there a giant purple man out there who's like, I have to collect all the stones? Listen, listen <laughs> I'm not going to get into it. Fine, right I'll this do it myself. myself. But watch this space. Happy episode 200. Uh, the green. So this is going to be like a whole show long thing, dude. This is going to be like a mega story. The green stone is done. We're done with the green stone. It's the step one of world building into we'll something We'll see you greater. guys. That was phase one. Are we about to enter our... our yes, our there's just a whole C bunch of new characters. Uh, uh, CCU, yeah, 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 phase yeah, yeah. two. I'm not going to say. I'm just going to say we brought in a new investigator. The, the vibe is different. He just wants to belong. And we're going to see some things. You know, we're going to see some new stuff. We had the OGs uh, <laughs> first. Uh, we just had like an origin story. This is a straight up RPG where we had the first game and we had all the characters. And now we have the new character going to be the main character in the second game. And there's going to be a whole bunch of new characters that we have to go recruit. To again, like, don't yeah. you see? You never defeated evil. Only one of the many gemstones of darkness. Oh, yeah. Get, great. So cool. <laughs> And my, and, my, and my next episode is going to be JFK. I need everyone to know that if at any point in the JFK episode, Alex goes, JFK was known to have a green stone. I'm going to, again, my <laughs> promise to walk into the ocean. It's, it's standing from here on out. It's, it's so a standing much, promise. It's so much different. It is, it is, the green stone does get way crazier than you will ever understand. <laughs> but also, but also, Dang. but also, it is Kingdom it is, Hearts level yes, lore? but it is also in no way at all what you think it's going to be. You okay? Just all right. just you wait, and it's not gonna. You you won't have to wait long for this. <laughs> I don't That's like this. Thing. Okay, I hate this. Yeah. I know, man. What's happening? Just get ready. I have to take the podcast away from you for another month or two. No, just get ready. Don't worry. The podcast will proceed as normal. You don't have to worry about the green stone anymore. But for those of you who do care, there is something coming. Okay, you don't have to worry. I don't know if I feel tantalized or like a sense of imposing doom. relief satisfaction every single question mark do you answer. feel satisfied mike jesse do you feel satisfied at the end of this i mean it it has a beginning <laughs> middle and an end the <laughs> traditional it narrative did, structure i mean so, yes. yeah we did yeah. get a story yeah as grounded and as stoic <laughs> as ever yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> fantastic <laughs> speaking of aliens we're oh, off to do a mini so <laughs> We were supposed to talk about aliens last week, uh, but we ended up talking about AI for 30 some odd minutes. So this week, all aliens for pretty much the whole time I'm talking anyway, and it'll probably be a while. Uh, so we're going to head over there and do that over at where is that, Alex? Where can people get mini sods? Boy, mini sods are not the only thing that you can get at patreon.com slash chill pod. Just what? you wait. Just you wait. I mean, you will. It's, it is mini sods, but like a lot more other stuff, too. You can get art. You can get pre-sale on merch. You can get uh what else can you get you can get rotten popcorn which we're probably gonna watch that weird boy living in the walls movie on uh and definitely not x files i will absolutely yeah. watch that with you that's like an a24 film but like the cheaper oh, yeah. one there's all kinds of stuff on patreon go check it out thank you for listening this has been the greenstone episode three part two michael thank you so much for being here on the show yeah thank uh, you thank you for having where me. shall we send people the, i said videogameapocalypse.com i don't know where's the place yeah. to send people to find you and your show VidjaGameApocalypse.com, and I'm not just mispronouncing that; it is also misspelled V I D J A Apocalypse or GameApocalypse.com. Vidja game. Vidja games. Yeah. VidjaGameApocalypse.com. Uh, that's where you can find me. You can also find me on Twitter at Wikiparas. That's W I K I P A R A Z. He's got the facts. Uh, yeah, sometimes, very rarely, will I tweet, but <laughs> it's there. Yeah, I don't have a blue check. There's yeah, that. That's high. Uh, that's punk. <laughs> none of us do it. Hell, bro. You know, yeah. it's all right. Mm -hmm. Uh so yeah thank you for having me it's been a lot of fun i'm 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 so honored to have been part of this saga i i bless this it. exploration of this saga I bless you it. had no you were like as soon as you were on episode one you had handcuffs around you you didn't realize it yet yeah 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 <laughs> okay one last thing okay, okay one last thing okay one last okay, thing like, oh yeah okay more oh sorry alex one go more ahead. revelation starting next week in the minisodes <laughs> for the next like several months i'm gonna just keep telling the story in the minisodes every single time and you don't have to worry about it in episodes anymore it's gonna be like 15 to 17 episodes of the minisodes so get hype oh you're going oh so the story is taking we're immediately going into next it next week starting and then 
okay. next week. All right. Next week. Get prepared for that. Head over to No me. more waiting. More Greenstone than you could ever want. Patreon.com slash Shilmani Pod. People have been asking for this for a while. Uh, we'll probably end up doing video for minisodes uh, soon. Very soon. So um, okay. people just want to see our faces. We're not going to do I overlay. Don't get that. They're just going to get that. I don't either, I don't... but people want it. So I'm going to make an AI know. version of myself. Uh, people have seen us in the live show pictures now. People know who we, you know. Yeah. People can find one. I'm not worried about that. I'm just picking my nose and farting. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, that's what most of the show is. Well, you guys yeah. tell stories. I'm over here there just like <laughs> deep. <laughs> Patreon.com slash Chili Money Pod. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Everybody, welcome back to the Illuminati Podcast. As always, I'm one of your hosts, Mike Martin, joined by the. I don't know who they are. There's two. One. Terrence Hill and Bud Spencer. No. Neo and Trinity. No. I don't understand, and I probably never will. Let me just tell you right now that there's two. Leon Kennedy and. Claire Redfield. I'm telling you, I think he literally just looked up famous duos. Cheech and Chong. And it's been going through the list ever since. I'm trying to dig deep. Which one of you is uh, Dick Powell? Me? Your name's Jesse Cox. <laughs> I want to love you. I want my my I want my Everybody. Welcome back to the Illuminati Podcast. As always, I'm one of your hosts, Mike Martin, joined by Alex and Jesse. Like a shooting star across the sky that's actually a UFO.